Entertainment system. Now you're playing with power. All right, everybody, welcome back to Console Wars of the Past. Today we are doing the Nintendo Entertainment System, and here it is, folks. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Here's the flap where you open up and put the cartridge in. Here the cartridge goes in there, and then you press down. It locks into place. Yeah, locks into place around the pins. I can show it off here. Oh. Knocking down Mario. Help me! We had them all set up and everything. So you push it down, power it on. Put close the flap down, of course, for safety. Yes, and you never... You don't have to see the, the cartridge in there. You playing a game? No, look! There's no game in there! <laughs> Tape over the power button. Yeah. So, so there's the there's the power button. There's your reset button next to it. Your two controller ports. Now, on the side here, we have the um, AV adapters, your audio and video. On the back, you have your AC adapter. You have your channel selector. And, and if you needed it for cable-ready televisions, go with an RF switch, which Nintendo released their own version of that. And on the bottom we have a port, which I don't know was ever used. Not in America. No, it was for, mostly for the Japanese market. They got all the cool stuff, like the Famicom disc system. Yeah. We didn't get that. Ah, eh, well, it happens. Now, let's take a look at the NES controller, the well-known NES controller. Here you have the, the first directional pad. Definitely able to hit up, down, left, and right independently. And B, A, B, A, select start. <laughs> A little, sorry. Now we have the zapper. Fire that puppy for me. As you can hear, there's a click. <laughs> this is the original zapper, the gray design. They made it orange so it looked less like a gun. I guess the parents were freaking out for some reason. Apparently somebody accidentally got shot when somebody else thought that they actually had a real gun when holding one of these. Oh, okay. I don't know. Perhaps. Well, that's kind of the, the lore. Somebody had a problem with it somewhere along the line. Well, that always happens. But this one I think is the cooler one. Yeah. Now, the, Nintendo also released um, some cool extra controller now they here's these tons of them. There was all sorts of stuff. Here's the uh, NES Max. The Max, where you have the free floating control button, so it just slides around on the face of of the the directional buttons there. So uh, this was good for some games. Most games it didn't work real well for, but it also had turbo function. So if you held these buttons, you would get turbo B and A. And it was a little bit smaller than the uh, a little more traditional compact. one. So that was an interesting item. Now this one's the one I really like. Here's the um, arcade stick for the Nintendo Entertainment System, the, the NES Vantage. The Advantage. Here we had uh, Mario playing with it there. He was testing it out before we started here. <laughs> now there's, you see, another solid arcade stick. You know, you can put some wear and tear on that puppy. You have your turbo switches, which looks like someone already had a little fun with that one. And there's the buttons that turn them on and off. Now this plugged into both controller ports at once, so you had to pick whether you were using player one or two. Yeah, okay. So, well, and it looks like it didn't matter at that point. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, slow-mo. So, you get nice the big, big buttons. Yes, for the... Arcade Advantage. Or track now, and field. Now, of course, with all good arcade pads, it had a nice, solid metal base, which is useful useful for knocking down brothers and other enemies. So, uh, 
you can judge a good arcade pad by how how hard the bottom is and how pointy the corners are because you can inflict all, a lot of damage. They're with also that. good for jabbing. So when in doubt, always use an arcade pad for uh, for battling. Yes, if you want to beat the crap somebody, use an arcade stick. And Mario is going to guard it for us here. Yes, he is our guardian today. Now we're going to take a look at some of the games we're going to be looking at today. Here is Battletoads. Battletoads is a fun game from Rare. Zelda 2, we have that actually with the original manual. So, so here's a look. Now, all games uh, that were licensed by Nintendo came with these nice protective sleeves to put them in. Yeah, they were really good for keeping it not dusty. And the manuals would stay right in them. You see, here's the original version of the Nintendo Seal of Approval. It would laser later change to like an oval football shape. Here you get some original artwork, which is the same artwork they used with Z Zelda 1 uh, from the cartoon series. Yeah, they had a really in-depth story in that. Um... Here's your town map. So you got really nice manuals with the Nintendo systems that you didn't see previously that would uh, really get you into the game. Yeah, it'd go a lot more in-depth than just your standard, you know, one or two page press the fire button to kill whatever. Yeah, so there's a lot to these. And of course, in the back you always wrote your secret notes and how to get through things. Yeah, and with the Zelda games you needed that normally. Here's a Tengen game. A black cartridge, unlicensed... Tengen game with the Tengen seal of quality, which really uh, brings to thought some sort of evil, I think. Yeah, they their seal of quality wasn't exactly quality. Tengen was an offshoot of Atari, who uh, released unlicensed games on the competing Nintendo system. And Even so, though they had a competing system on the market. Yeah, and uh, so they had these special cartridges that were different than everyone else's cartridges. They had the two little flaps here to pull on them. So, something different that you might find in your collection. Here's Super Mario Brothers 2, the uh, official Nintendo cartridge. Metroid. Now, see the um, the silver design there? That was what they did with the original um, set of games they released. And they all kind of had that silver lining to them. And they also used these pixelated graphics on all of them, so they uh, really looked like uh, kind of what kind of what the game would look like in the game. And then later they kind of switched that to go with more traditional artwork. Yeah, like the Dr. Mario cartridge here, where you see the little viruses and Mario there. It looked more like artwork. And Lolo, which is a really nice puzzle game. Cool artwork. They have Star Tropics, you know, Tropical Island here. Uh, Little Nemo, the Dream Master. A lot of stuff You'll see the Capcom there. cartridges always had their Capcom logo at the top there. And here we have uh, Final Fantasy, which, as you can see, the original Final Fantasy had the world, and it had a save battery in it. That's what that gold sticker meant. Yeah, if the game had the gold sticker on the back, that meant it was a battery-backed-up game, and you'd actually be able to save it rather than get passwords or just have to play through it every time. And you would need to hit reset when you did that. Now when they released Final Fantasy, they released a ton of materials with it. So, you know, you got this map here showing you some of the dungeons. Which on is the, very, very helpful, by the way. On the back you have uh, different magic and weapons and the effects they have, who can use them. Yeah, you don't see this every day. I yeah. mean, these are rarely found today at all. Yeah, these... Uh, you know, a lot of people just chuck these in the garbage when they got them, so... Here's a whole lot of city stuff. area. Yeah, this is what's really nice here. You get to see everything that you're going to encounter in the game. Very nice. Ooh, There's the final chaos boss, in Chaos. The corner. That is danger. Very, very nice city area there. Now, on the other side, you have the full game world map. The towns you need to go to... Put your notes beside the place on the on the map if you want. So you know where there's uh, little pieces and everything, and you can you can basically create your own adventure here. You yeah. Know, they kind of threw into the kind of tied it together with a whole pen and paper thing. Yeah, nice package with it to give you the background of all the characters rather than just throw you into the world. You get an idea of what you're battling, what you can pick up, get you into the game a little bit deeper, and especially considering that was a fairly new genre for the consoles so so here it is 
So everybody, that's the Nintendo Entertainment System. So we're going to play these games and have some fun. Say bye, Mario. Goodbye. Hello everybody and welcome to NewGenGamers.com's Console Wars of the Past. This is Ray playing the part of Mario and this is Ron. I'll be Donkey Kong today. Alright, well we don't seem to have the um, the damsel in distress, so... But I am naked, so if that counts... Um, that was just disturbing. Okay. You're the one <laughs> sitting next to me. Yes, I know. <laughs> For the sake of these videos. <laughs> Alright. So so let's get into some Donkey Kong here. Now we are covering the NES in this section of our Console Wars documentary. And this is the most iconic game. This is the one that put Nintendo on the map, basically. Yeah, this was their breakout hit uh, in the arcade scene. And uh, so we're going to be looking at some of the pivotal games that made Nintendo an early success and made uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Famicom, uh, as it was called in Japan, uh, the most popular systems of their time, and there was a reason for it. Great marketing, great games, and, uh, and so we're going to be looking at everything that went along with that. And this, this system also went down as probably one of the most well-known systems of all time as well. Uh, if you look back, you even look in today's marketing, you'll see um, like things that make NES references, like uh, the Konami code and like the just the controller and everything. I'm wearing a Goomba shirt, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, you see a tons of like just reference to this system. And Ray didn't wear that shirt just because we were recording this. That's just what he wears. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was between this and my um, Steelers Super Bowl t-shirt. I went with the Goomba today. <laughs> As so, you can see, we're progressing through here. So we're looking at Donkey Kong. Uh, it originally came out in 1981 in the arcades. And this is uh, the best home version of it up to that point because um, earlier versions that were done on other consoles uh Look like crap. They looked like crap. They were really limited, whereas this was essentially the full port of the arcade game. And you didn't just get Donkey Kong on this. You also got Donkey Kong Jr., which we'll take a look at. So this was a two-for-one deal as well. So uh, really a great package and still a, a really great, fun, popular game. And it to took off in the arcades uh, in Japan... And uh, Nintendo it, of America was formed to market this game in America and uh, to distribute it. Yeah, this is the one that basically, you know, made Nintendo popular and created a an icon in the gaming industry. This was the first game by famed designer Shigeru Miyamoto. Well, we'll get more into him as we go here. Uh, but let's talk about early Nintendo of America once this game was launched because up to this point there was no Nintendo of America for their arcade venture. We simply had Nintendo in Japan and different companies distributing the games in America and Nintendo was not happy with these deals and so they decided to open their own American firm and uh, sell them directly. Yeah and what happened was um Hiroshi Yamauchi sent over um, his son-in-law to form Nintendo of America. Hiroshi Yamauchi being uh, Nintendo's president uh, for basically the latter half of the 20th century. Yeah, he took and, over in, what, 1949, I believe it was? Yes, so uh, we'll be talking about him a lot <clears throat> here as we go along as well. Sorry, I reference these people just you know, in passing, just because I've heard their names so many times. Yeah, all these uh, people at Nintendo are now, at this point, legends in the industry. So, uh, they're rather well known, but, um, you know, we want to cover the whole story here. So, uh, Hiroshi Yamauchi sends his son-in-law, Minora Arakawa, to America, to New York City, to sell Nintendo 
uh, games. And it works out pretty well for them. I mean, in, in the early run, they didn't have too much success. They created a game called Radar Scope, which did not sell at all. It, it was a pretty horrible title, to and, be honest. And that was uh, Shigeru Miyamoto's first project with the company uh, that he was involved with. And so that was an attempt and the first time that we saw all of the, the big names at Nintendo, uh, who would be Shigeru Miyamoto, Gunpei Yokoi, Hiroshi Yamauchi, and then Minora Arakawa, uh, who would come in when they came to America, uh, they were all involved in Radar Scope. But it was not a great game and it was not a huge success. Yeah, I, I don't know. That, that one just kind of stuck with the traditional like space doom type thing or yeah they they didn't think outside the box which is where nintendo took off so uh what did happen was shigeru miyamoto liked what they had created and decided to take the game engine and take the game board and make a different game out of it and he took that game and decided to come up with just a fun idea that um, where there was this giant monkey who had taken this woman captive and it, the kind of the literal translation of Donkey Kong is just a uh, stupid ape yes and they actually got into a little bit of trouble with um, Universal because they thought they were ripping off uh, King Kong there was a whole lawsuit about it yeah because <laughs> In the poorly translated Japanese dictionary that they were using, uh, when they looked up the uh, the English version of the of an ape or a you know large monkey, it said Kong. Yeah. So Nintendo Nintendo thought that a monkey was called a Kong in yeah. America. <laughs> a an ape was a Kong, so they named the character. Kong. Kong. <laughs> now, the donkey part was, again, a poor English mistranslation. That was supposed to be an ass, a jerk, a protagonist. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> and so when, when they looked up that translation, it brought up ass, which translated to donkey. So they ended up with Donkey Kong, and as you said, Universal tried suing them over uh, the name infringement uh, of using Kong. So, this was successful. This was yeah. the first breakout hit for Shigeru Miyamoto, for Nintendo, and for Nintendo of America. Now we're going to take a look at um, something that was launched a little bit later. And, it, and the, the significant thing with this, too, was as we said it was not space doom this was a completely out of the box outside the box thinking. outside the box crazy game and what Shigeru Miyamoto would then make his name for doing so let's move on all right we are taking a look now at excite bike this is a um, early look at the um, Nintendo's early sports library where they took a motocross rider and um, just let you play around on a track with him. Yeah, and this is a really fun game. Really, really fun. Uh, now this, be the, this is game. the race portion of the game. Yeah, you can also design your own tracks. You can also do time trials. Oh, I always love the... Um, design your own track portion. You always make the most evil track possible and see if you can do it. Yeah, we might take a look at that here uh, once we race some races. And you can cut off your opponents and wreck them, and you can also get wrecked yourself, so you have to be careful of where you are. Yeah, they really did a lot with this engine. I mean, um... Oh, oh looks like we have a collision here. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to wreck him. Ooh. And as you wreck, you got to get back on your bike, so if you hit the buttons... Uh, your guy will get back on his bike faster. You have to try not to overheat. So if you press the B button, you'll uh, use your turbo, but you'll overheat if you hold it too long, so you have to switch back to your regular throttle, which is the A button. And you can hit the little men running across the road, which 
I always really enjoyed. <laughs> Maybe that was just the sick, sadistic side of me, but I was six, and hey. The winner is you. A winner is me. <laughs> and so uh, there's only a couple tracks, but they're all really fun. And I love that pause sound, by the way. Yeah, you can... Um... Let me try wrecking someone here. There we nice. go. Nice. Yeah, that's the key to uh, staying ahead of the competition. Now, one thing about this is you're not actually racing these guys. They're not holding any positions. You're racing a time, a time, and so you just need to to finish the course within specific amounts of time. And the uh, the other riders don't really matter. So you just try and avoid them or rack them for fun. <laughs> they just added in there for Bam. extra. Ooh, that was a mistake. That was a risky move, but I think it was worth it in the end. Because <laughs> you ran him <laughs> down. Yeah, all right. So, uh, this now, was uh, Now, we were another... discussing the early Nintendo strategy here. Yeah, this was another great early arcade success for them, uh, following up the, the successes that they were having with Donkey Kong and some other early stuff. And this was um, also one of their early oh. NES uh, titles, like one of their first ones. Yeah. Uh, I believe, if my facts are straight, that this was a launch title. There was 18 games that they launched with the NES, and this, I believe, was one of them. So Excite Bike really was um, the, only, the only racer in the early portion of the NES's lifespan here in America. Yeah, and... It especially from Nintendo. They never really uh, got into racing games a whole lot, although they did do a follow-up of this uh, called Mario Excite Bike on the uh, Satellaview online service in Japan. But it was only available in Japan and only through that service, but it had all the Mario characters uh, in Excite Bike, which I've never played that but would be really interested to, but it's, it's not available, so I wish Nintendo would re-release it. There was a 64 follow-up as well. There was, but it was done by Left Field Productions, um, uh, which was Nintendo's, um, one of their dream team efforts for the N64. So uh, that is um, interesting that they brought that back. And then they also have done the Excite Truck game now for Wii, which it's kind of gotten away from this, whereas uh, the Mario Excite Bike game was a side-scrolling game like this one. Nice, you landed on his head. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> one of the best tactics. So, uh, the N64 version as well was uh, 3D. It was a 3D version, so it was different as well. So, this one and the Super Nintendo one in Japan were really the only ones uh, that played like this. Dun, 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 dun. Gotta love the, n the early Nintendo music, too. Yeah, it's so simple, but all the, the themes are really catchy. And that was something that a lot of these early game designers uh, had to do was not only did they have to program the game and uh, write the entire game code, they also had to do their own music. And you'll notice with Nintendo's titles, and especially Shigeru Miyamoto's, the music is really good. And uh, Shigeru Miyamoto wrote most of those songs, the Mario theme, the Zelda theme, the Donkey Kong theme that we heard earlier. Oh, there was a guy that wrote that, that actually is credited with that. Oh, really? I okay. can't remember his name right now. Um, somebody on our YouTube comments left us the actual name. Oh, really? So Miyamoto didn't uh, write that song? It wasn't Miyamoto. It was um, another guy. I can't remember what his name is right now. Okay. I can look it up in between here. For the Donkey Kong one. Uh, just for Donkey Kong? Somebody wrote um, the original Legend of Zelda theme. It wasn't Miyamoto, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was actually surprised to hear that. I thought Miyamoto had done them. Yeah, I did, too. All but right. apparently there was a composer at Nintendo that was making all these great tunes, and no one gave him credit. Which happened a lot in uh, these Japanese companies. A lot of people didn't get a lot of credit for a lot of things. So we'll keep going back to Shigeru Miyamoto because he is kind of the golden child of the company and always highly regarded but there were so many people that did so many things that uh, were kind of overlooked and overshadowed yeah it's too bad that some of these people didn't get noticed before like beforehand do we want to uh, look reset at the... this and we'll show the design yeah let's look at the uh, track editor and I'm not sure which team did this game uh, whoops but uh, 
Uh, reset that one. Are more you time. running the track? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Now here you can pick all the different uh, pieces that you can put in the track. So we'll just go ahead and put some crazy stuff in here. Ooh. Oh, it's gonna get more treacherous yet. No, not that. That. Ooh. <laughs> Followed by that. That's just evil. Now we're going to have to run this course. <laughs> now the the whole idea behind when you did this was, you know, you design your track and you see if your friends can finish it. That's yeah, that I was the greatest good thing. There. So yeah, go, go for ahead. that. Go ahead and uh Ender? Start that. Now, as I said, um, I'm not sure who designed uh, oops, uh, this one, but there were several R&D teams at Nintendo uh, that were divided up. So each team worked on different projects. Yeah, they, they had different... They were pretty much just called R&Ds, I believe. Yeah, and uh, Nintendo has now combined all of their R&Ds into... Uh, one company just as um, EAD which was originally um, R&D number three which was Shigeru Miyamoto's group so they've combined everything into that one house as far as their in-house first party stuff now they oh, do, they do have a separate office in Tokyo now they opened a Tokyo office which is uh, I'm not sure if they they offshooted that after because it opened in, I believe it was 2004. Okay. So well, it's more I, th of I a think they did. Thing. Uh, the EAD uh, conglomeration was in 2005, I think. Okay. Uh, but they still have their second parties that operate, you know, semi independently and everything as well. So. But they just tried to get everything all under one. One group and uh, all under one head, basically, with. Uh, President Satoru Iwata at the very top, and then Miyamoto and the other top heads, and basically just structure everything under one branch. Yeah. And so it's it's a very complex company, and they've been so prolific in their game design that, uh, you know, they've released the most of the best games that have ever existed. So their talent pool is so deep. All right, I think uh, that's enough. Excite Bike, an oh, awesome we've game. Through that, that it is awesome. sweet. That was a horrible track, by the way. Yeah, it was. It was evil. <laughs> it was fun, though. I enjoyed it. Okay. Technos Japan. Ah, ah. ha ha. To play. Okay. Select. Start. Now, to clarify what we were talking about uh, previously, um, with the conglomeration of the uh, Nintendo R&D groups, they just took all the existing R&Ds and put them all under the EAD branch. And so there are uh, offshoots of that now, such as that EAD Tokyo, but um, they just basically wanted to conglomerate all the existing houses into EAD. Yeah, so they're not all working on projects independently. But that would be in the future. What we're looking at in this era was uh, several distinct R&D groups and with the success of Donkey Kong Shigeru Miyamoto was given his own R&D group which became R&D number three he was previously under uh, Gunpei Yokoi at R&D one which would do uh, a significant amount of the hardware R&D number two would also do a lot of hardware for them now, do we know which R&Ds did which hardware? Um, I think R&D 1 did the NES, if I remember correctly. I believe so. Uh, R&D 1 also did Nintendo's first home system, uh, which maybe we should mention, uh, which was called the TV Color uh, Game. That's it, the TV Color Game. Well, that's an interesting title. <laughs> and all it was was a Pong clone. Uh, they were uh, given the rights to sell the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan. And so uh, they saw basically what that did and 
what Pong was and made their own version. And it was just a simple Pong clone and uh, just had several variations with different colored lights. And that was the first project uh, that Miyamoto worked on with R&D number one uh, as far as hardware goes. And oh, um, you know, we went off into the story and we completely forgot to mention what game we're playing. <laughs> we are playing River City Ransom by Tekanos. Which is an awesome beat-em-up, probably one of the best beat-em-ups of the era. Yeah, and uh, it it plays really well, and it was a great arcade game that was brought home. And uh, we'd see these characters used in pretty much all of Technos's games during this era, such as Nintendo World Cup, and uh, also, uh, I forget what the tag, what I believe it's Super Dodgeball. But yeah, that is an awesome game, and so is uh, Nintendo World Cup. Um, so those are definitely worth checking out, because they play pretty much like River City Ransom. Now, as you can see here in this game, unlike a lot of beat 'em ups, there's buildings you can go into. There's some uh, RPG elements to it. People you can talk to, and we um, Our... can't afford any of those things. I am I am broke. But you can buy food and power-ups, so we're going to go ahead and keep fighting here. And I'm going to throw my weapon at this jerk and beat the shit out of him. Now this is all about fighting. It's just a good old beat-em-up. I got a trash can here. <laughs> I'm going to pick my weapon back up that I threw at that guy after killing him, and then throw it at this guy. Oh yeah, jump kick. I'm the king of the WrestleMania um, trash can move here. <laughs> yeah, this is an awesome game, a good two-player affair. Let's head up here. Things okay. get hairy up here. Bam! Oh yeah, getting out some chains. We'll see about that. Watch out! Watch out! Ah. And uh, so this is essentially the meat of the game. Yeah, beat them up. Yeah, it's one of the more successful ones of the time, too. I mean, the beat 'em up genre really started to take off in this generation because these systems could handle it. You saw games like um, Double Dragon also take off. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, this and Double Dragon were probably the best two of the genre during the era. Now, would we count Battletoads as a beat 'em up? Yeah, it definitely plays like a beat 'em up. So we'll be taking a look at that, uh, which basically has the same mechanics. Except your toads. Yes, and you have giant fists. <laughs> giant fists are cool. So, um... Well, now, what... I've been noticing the little story element down at the bottom there. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing, is it added a little bit of a story to it. What happened there? I have no idea. Um, let's kill this guy. Get over here. Do you have, like, brass knucks on? Ow. Now we seem to be experiencing a lot of slowdown in this game. Like it'll speed up and slow down. Yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Ow! <laughs> why this game has such severe slowdown? Uh, it could just have been the port too. I mean, this was a classic game, but okay, maybe we're not supposed to go that way. Yeah, let's head back. What's up here? No, oh, that's can't go in there. I See, think there's a boss battle here. Whoa! As Ray carries me along. Hey. Yo, dude, chill out, says Barry. You chill out, Barry. <laughs> Yo, dude, <laughs> chill out. Wow. Now, that's the most complicated storyline, but... No. But it doesn't need to be. Yeah, for a beat-em-up, you really don't need a complicated story. You just need to know that there's dudes that are causing trouble and that you're here to whoop their ass. And that's really all that's needed. And they all flash when they die. <laughs> they do. They fall down and they grimace. And the best thing about Technos' characters is the grimaces they uh, Oh, have. yeah, I love their grimaces. Like oh, his eyes pop bam, out there. Bam, bam! <laughs> uh, He's like... And, and they also use that in the Nintendo World Cup and dodgeball games. So when you'd knock those players down, they'd also over-exaggerate like yeah. that. I love the facial expressions on NES it, games. It's like uh, anime characters, really. So we'll move on here. I think that uh, might be uh -oh, where... Oops. Uh-oh. All right. Well, I think we've taken a, a good look here at uh, 
River City Ransom. I mean, you can just keep going with this, but, you know, this is basically what you get with the game, and it's, it's a it's really awesome. fun time. Yeah. If you want to check out a great retro game, check it out. It's uh, definitely a cult classic. Ooh. Actually. Uh-oh. Is that our boss? Oh, that's me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, dude. <laughs> I have been terminated. Oh, uh, we both been terminated. Ray. Sorry. <laughs> well, I had it coming, I guess. <laughs> All right, so that's River City Ransom. Moving on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Those things happen in beat-em-ups. Here on Console Wars, Wars of, of the, the Past, Past, part two, two point something, we're looking at Super Mario Brothers. All right. And Ray will be playing the part of Mario today. He's yes. He's wearing a Goomba shirt with this with the phrase "Game Over" on it, as to entice the Goombas into submitting to his will. And so far, they are. So. Here is the seminal Nintendo Entertainment System game. The game that virtually everyone's played, virtually everyone knows, and made this character on screen the most known character in the world. More known than Jesus, I'm gonna say. <laughs> or at least in video game history. <laughs> He's ranks pretty high up there. He did, uh, according to real research and pools done, uh, become more recognizable than Mickey Mouse and other famous cartoon characters. He was the most known fictional cartoon character. Uh, so that's very significant. Yeah, that's a really good accolade right there. So this was another one done by Shigeru Miyamoto. Now, going back to uh, the story in our previous episode... Uh, Nintendo released the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan for Magnavox and distributed it. So they decided they could do this themselves. Hiroshi Yamauchi was a harsh, brash man and said, we could do this. We have talented individuals. Let's make our own. So he puts Gunpei Yokoi and R&D number one on the task of creating the Color TV game released in 1977 in Japan, and it was a Pong Odyssey clone machine, uh, like a Sears telegame. All of those machines were essentially the same. Of course, I have to grab every coin along the way. <laughs> Ray is compulsive when it comes to coins. At least with this game. <laughs> so, uh, the, the machine was released, and that got Nintendo into the uh, home hardware market. They would later on release the Game & Watch machines uh, during 1980 and 1981, also designed by uh, Gunpei Yokoi, which would later be the inspiration for the Game Boy. But uh, we'll talk more about those uh, if we do a co console wars for Game Boy. So uh, this was the next huge, huge hit for them after Donkey Kong. And again, it came from Miyamoto-san. He became prolific. And the guy is a futurist, and he thinks very outside the box. And as we spoke about Donkey Kong, it was unlike any other game. There was no other game where you had to jump barrels and a donkey or a monkey through bear or was up there taking a girl. There was nothing else like that. It was very, very odd. And so is this game. This same character that was in uh, the Donkey Kong game, the protagonist Jumpman, who was given a name for this title. Which, he got his well, name uh, yes. from the, um, basically the landlord of Nintendo of America. He was uh, a pudgy Italian dude that came in and, you know, was asking for the rent money. And they decided to name the character after him because he looks so similar to their character, Jumpman. So, hence, Mario was born from a landlord. <laughs> so that's how Mario became a fat Italian plumber. <laughs> because he was a bad Italian stereotype of the, of the landlord collecting rent. 
So it's very appropriate. Now, um, um, the idea behind um, Miyamoto coming up with this game was he basically came up with an idea of what if you could just walk down the street and you hit something that you don't know is there and you find it. Miyamoto views the world as a theoretical, theoretical physicist. He, he views the world as multidimensional and uh, views the possibility of, of alternate dimensions and, and applies that to these game designs. And so uh, that was the question is, what if there were things that weren't there? What if there were alternate things that you could not see? And, and he just ran with that with this and like that right there that hidden little block uh, there are hidden tricks and items all throughout this game which gave it a lot of replayability even though the levels are the same it was a challenge to to find where all the little tricks and hidden items were and that was uh, one of the first games to offer a lot of that kind of Easter egg uh, uh, type experience you know not as just one little thing that it's all through the it's literally he hit things throughout this entire game such as the ability that of being able to beat the game in five minutes if you know where the time warps are if you know how to fly through it all you can beat the game in five minutes but if you you know take your time it could take you over two three hours you know if you're not that great at it <laughs> so there again Miyamoto plays with the idea of of time and space and alternate dimensions and alternate realities and vines out of nowhere and vines that go, go nowhere out of nowhere uh, just really crazy uh, just off the wall uh, ideas oh well <laughs> that that nobody else could really imagine and it, it, it really is the uh, you know people call his uh, design sometimes very childlike and uh, very um, family oriented, but I really look at them as very science fictiony and very visionary. Uh, is very, a good word. Yeah, very visionary, very just outside of the box, uh, theoretically thinking what could possibly be reality. And uh, Miyamoto's games are never ones that you know you just kill things. Yeah, it's not <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, we were discussing that earlier, uh, and before Miyamoto came along, that pretty much was what games were about. Was you had Pong, which was you know a two-player affair. But after that, when games began to get depth during the Atari era, it was basically kill things. And most games that have come out and that we've seen, you kill things. But in Miyamoto's game, there's always that other thing. Like, yeah, you have to kill things here, but that's not really what it's about. It's more about the experience. And, and, and just I, the... Sometimes the, you know, the level design is always... Of his games are so well thought out. And they're so weird. I wanted Ray to, to play through this level because in some of our other videos we've looked at some of the other levels. And this, this is one you don't see very often. This is one you don't see often and you see how everything's black and white and just very dark and ominous and weird and... They use a lot of uh, subtle effects in the game. I mean, it's not its not a masterwork and ambiance, but it's just the concepts and ideas, and then the fact that the gameplay is impeccable, and Miyamoto created a standard for how a game should be played, and uh, that, that everyone has copied since then. Game designs... Since Miyamoto's games have uh, almost all copied off of his original designs in some way, he's prolific. So we're going to look at a ton of his specific titles today. Uh, and, and all of and them, you're going to have a different feeling to each one. I mean, this is going to feel like a Miyamoto fest by the end of it, just because he had such a hand in the early works of Nintendo. But there are so many talented individuals at that company, and we're going to look at so many, uh, an equal number of titles not directly made by Shigeru Miyamoto that are stupendous. And we and, can't forget the wonderful third parties that really 
brought themselves to shine in this generation. So, in the end, this console was a, a total success because it had a huge breadth of titles. It uh, created new titles that we hadn't seen on home consoles before um, and just did a lot of amazing things with interaction in video games and just in the way they were played, way, the way they were evil. thought out. We got puzzle games, we got RPGs, we got these beat-em-up games, we got these wacky games from Shigeru Miyamoto all during the Nintendo Entertainment System's life. And this Brought is... home by Nintendo. Yes, and now we're going to take a look at the other game that was on this package, Duck Hunt. Another of their odd titles, and one not done by Shigeru Miyamoto. Game select. There we go. I am a mess of chords. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> Alright, everybody. Now we're back, and we're going to play some Duck Hunt. Let's do one duck. As you see, the infamous dog. One of the most annoying characters ever. And unfortunately, you can't kill the dog. No. But he is so happy when you get a duck. He's a very happy dog. Now, now this, this... Go ahead. This one utilized the zapper. Go ahead, I'll shoot. You talk. Yeah, this, this used the light gun zapper technology that Nintendo had developed... Uh, and used in bowling alleys, um, they essentially did the same thing that this game does. They would uh, put the image of the duck or whatever on the, the back of the wall, and you would shoot with the light gun and try and get a high score. And it was just something for a novelty that young people could do. So when they made their home system, they decided to bring the technology home. And we're not g having a whole lot of luck killing the ducks here. So, it's been a while. The technology uses uh, CRT monitors to sense where the shot's located based off of the uh, horizontal, horizontal scan lines that the television uh, flashes, which makes up the picture. Whenever the light gun sees that location mirrored back to the light gun, it knows where you're shooting. Quit laughing at me. <laughs> so you can't play these on LCD screens, uh, and you can't emulate them, at least not directly, obviously, because you'd have to have the input sensor. So, uh... My eyes just off. You, if you want to play these <laughs> games, you have to keep an old, uh, mo an old television or monitor around that, that has horizontal scan lines. So apparently, Gat style doesn't work either. <laughs> this uh, isn't working out real well. But sorry, folks, we don't suck at duck hunt. It's just uh, maybe the TV's at a weird angle or something. Got one. <laughs> you got one. If you get the rest of them, you might make the round. But this was a pack-in game. Uh, after the NES was out for a little bit, and once Super Mario Brothers came out, they packaged uh, Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt onto one cartridge and released it with the Nintendo Entertainment System. So, Super Mario Brothers became, and still is, the number one selling game of all time due to its pack-in with the NES. It sits at 40 million copies sold. The Nintendo Entertainment System itself sits at 62 million units sold. So, uh, a lot of those Mario games came with the NES, and so obviously a lot of Duck Hunts have sold as well. Now here's the skeet shooting uh, part of the game, so you can sh shoot ducks, or for you pacifists that don't want to kill real ducks, or, <laughs> or artificial virtual ducks, <laughs> or virtual artificial ducks, you can also do the skeet shooting. Or for, uh, this one's more accurate, I think. <laughs> Maybe I just suck at shooting ducks. So this is the pretty much the extent of the game. You try and beat 
the challenges of how many you have to get each time. They go faster, and more will appear on the screen at one time. And it's a great time. Now, the, the Zapper was released to uh, be a significant peripheral for the system, but uh, you didn't see a whole lot of titles that actually supported it. There were only a handful, and most of them weren't that good. And Nintendo didn't put much support behind it themselves, which didn't help. You know, if they had had maybe a couple titles beyond Hogan's Alley that really took advantage of it, maybe we would have seen something. Well, Duck Hunt's still a classic, though. But Duck Hunt uh, was a great time, and considering the Zapper came with the system, everyone had one, so if you had the system, you had Duck Hunt. Yeah, so, well, that was our look at Duck Hunt. So, enjoy it. Yes. Get yourself an old NES and play some duck. We got it. I guess you got the touch. After wrestling with the Nintendo Entertainment System, we get the screen. And uh, right. so here we go with Bubble Bubble from Taito. Now it's the beginning of a fantastic journey into the Cave of Monsters. Can you see? I can. Okay. We forgot to uh, switch, switch our, it over. Switch our monitor <laughs> arrangement after the last. Yeah, we needed segment. the uh, CRT for Duck Hunt, and now we're uh, forgot to switch it to the LCD. But that's fine. <laughs> Hooray! Yay! Now we'll move on to the next level. This was a great two-player game. You just go through and try to knock off the little toaster men. Wind up toaster men. Reminds me of that movie, The Brave Little Toaster. Except they're evil. And I'm hogging all the points there, sorry. How in <laughs> any way can a toaster be brave? I don't, that's the worst idea Apparently ever. you haven't seen the movie. No, I have not. Oh, oh I love The Brave Little I Toaster. He died. He died? Oh, man. So, uh, your goal here is to jump around on the different platforms and kill the toaster men and other enemies that come after you. Oh, they got me. Using your bubbles and bouncing around here. Grabbing your points. That one's going to drop a apple or something. See. Now, there are letters on the side, which I'm not sure. Those have some significance, but God help me if I can remember what they do. I, ne I did figure it out. I've been playing this a lot lately since they just released it on the virtual console. I rebought it. <laughs> and here's the uh the wizard robes. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Apparently something killed me. <laughs> Get me off this train. <laughs> yeah, and they have different puzzles and different uh, level areas, and you kind of have to figure out what's what, and they get more difficult as you go along here. Now, these are the more simpler ones. In design, this is uh, kind of similar to Mario Brothers. Not Super Mario Brothers that we were looking at a little bit ago, but Mario Brothers. The arcade title. The arcade version. Uh, where in that game you had to flip the enemies over and then clear them off the stage. Here you shoot the bubbles. But essentially the same kind of design. Now check that out. <laughs> this is where the puzzle element starts coming in. Yeah, and this is from Taito, who uh, had by this point gained their fame for uh, having Space Invaders. The most popular game of the... Uh... Well, one of the most popular games of the Atari 2600 era. Yeah, and of the arcades, and the first huge uh, Japanese title to be big in America. Yeah, I died. <laughs> and uh, so as you can see here, he's speeding up and getting vicious. Yeah, there we go. Nice, Hooray! grab the martinis. Oh, he's going to get Martini! all fudged up. <laughs> so, uh, Taito released this. And um, they were eventually bought out by Square Enix. And uh, so they are now owned by Square Enix. 
And uh, yep. some of their other significant titles are uh, Arkanoid, which was also had a great Nintendo port. Yeah, Tidy Taito had a lot of good titles. Super Puzzle Bubble or what? It, Pubble, Bubble Bubble uh, Bubble 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 Puzzle Bubble and uh, Bust a Move. Which Bust were a the, Move. They were the same game design, uh, but they were awesome. Nice. Ah. Uh, okay. So that's Bubble Bobble. Yeah, and that a was great th it's early a really third good party two player effort. affair too. Really good two player affair. Grab a buddy and tear into it. Bust some bubbles. Always be there. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Console Wars of the Past. Here we're doing the NES era. And now we're playing Ghosts and Goblins. You want to play two-player on this? Oh, uh, yeah, because we're going to die very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very challenging game. Challenging? <laughs> challenging as in it kicks you in the testicles challenging. There is our protagonist, Arthur, in his skivvies, trying to get his Mac on, and a demon comes out of the sky. Well, when that happens, you just got to kill all the zombies and try and get your girl back. So that's what Arthur's doing. This is from Capcom. Who's well known for nigh impossible games. Yes, <laughs> and uh, this was another arcade game originally brought, to, brought home. And this was significant for Nintendo because they brought home all the Nintendo, or uh, all of the, the Japanese... great arcade titles. Well, the Japanese arcade titles that were coming out from companies like Konami, Capcom, and uh, Taito, and uh, Fuck. <laughs> and so they latched onto these companies, and they became really pivotal. As you can see, it's frantic. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Nintendo began to dominate the third-party uh, relationships. They the competing systems could not get. Uh, the games that Nintendo was getting, and Nintendo strong-armed the companies to keep the games on Nintendo as time went on. So, uh, we've seen over time that the companies Capcom, Konami, Squaresoft, and um, uh, Namco, were, Namco uh, had a good run there. <laughs> they're, they're the companies that have really helped win the console war for each... Uh, for each company that succeeded with with a system, if you don't have those companies' support, you're, you're in, in trouble. Tr you are in big trouble, and that's more. Good example with that would be the N64. Yeah, they didn't have support from any of them, and that killed them. And Sony did, and they took over the industry. Oh, with games from those companies, those RPGs, the Resident Evils, uh, you know, all that stuff that came out. And so during this time, Nintendo owned those relationships. Oh, man, I walked Not right into that. Not to mention a huge PlayStation title, Tekken. Yeah, I mean, just tons and tons of them uh, have solidified each console war winner. And so the Nintendo is rife with stuff. And we're going to be looking at a, str a string of third-party titles here. We looked at a, a Taito game with uh, Bubble Bobble. Looking at a, a Capcom game. <laughs> <laughs> with ghosts and goblins here, which will cause you to <laughs> curse at it many times. Ra randomly spout Tourette's and profanities from your tongue. There's really no way around it. <laughs> this game hates you. <laughs> this game is insanely difficult uh, because it's unrelenting. There's no good strategy. The, the enemies are very sporadic. They attack from a lot of different angles and a lot of different ways. So you're just basically trying to survive. You want to talk about survival horror, here you go. I don't even know what that thing does. Yeah, I, I always thought it brought uh, back your armor, no, but it, it never does. Yeah, you don't get your armor back. This, this game is ignorant and unrelenting. Was that in Super Ghosts and Goblins, or Super Ghouls and Ghosts, that you get the armor back sometime? It must be, because this game, there is no, no such thing... You have two chances. You get hit twice, you're dead. So we're almost through an entire game of and Ghosts and Goblins. And we haven't even goblins. made the 
first part. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the game design of this reminds me a lot of uh, Trojan for the NES as well, which was also ridiculously hard. I remember playing that and just could not get to the end of it. And it had a similar, a similar map layout where you'd see all these areas that you were trying to get to and you're just like, I'm not that far and I'm not going to get there. But you'd try and try. But you'd always, you know... Oh, great. Uh, keep trying. Oh, come on! And that was the replayability of these games, was trying to figure them out and master them. Ray's done. I've got one more shot. I bet I'm going to beat the game in this this shot. This is all I need. Watch me. I'm going to cover my headset now. I need to get something out. Yeah, Ray's head uh, is about Mother to... Motherfucking son of a bitch! I don't know if the public heard that or not. <laughs> Ray just punched me. <laughs> For no reason. I just have fuel. He has ghosts and goblins in his veins now. This game is evil. You want to talk about games causing violence? <laughs> yeah, this it, game it causes violence. It doesn't have anything to do with the game content. It has to do with the challenge of the game. I guarantee you more Nintendo Entertainment System controllers were smashed because of this game than, than any Grand Theft Auto. That's <laughs> right. If there's anything that old school Nintendo and Capcom brought you was challenge. <laughs> it Constant challenge. <laughs> and as Ray said, this game had a follow-up on the uh, Super Nintendo, Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Which is also fantastic. Yeah, but e equally good and equally difficult. Yeah, hard as hell. <laughs> what makes this game so hard is the enemies, you can't get lined up with them very easily, so you're you're just prone to get hit. All right. All right, that game yeah. is evil. Let's play another evil game, but not evil quite that as, way. <laughs> not quite as unrelenting. What's it like to play the Nintendo Entertainment System? The Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, you're playing with power. Will you be the one to witness the birth of the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System? The one to play with Rob, the extraordinary video robot, batteries not included. He helps you tackle even the toughest challenge. Will you be the first to raise the incredibly accurate Zapper and play games like Duck Hunt or action-packed Hogan's Alley and high-flying Kung Fu, each sold separately? Will you be the one to experience the Nintendo Entertainment System? Comes with Rob, Zapper, Control Deck, Two Controllers, Gyromite, and Duck Hunt. スーパーマリオブラザーズ秘密の力で大きく変身地上に地下に海に空に次々に展開する不思議な世界スーパーマリオブラザーズ Yo, video game dudes, talk to me! This is Game Genie, Broke Woo! The awesome video game enhancer for your Nintendo Entertainment System. Attach it to most of your video games. Double Dragon 3 or Super Mario Bros. 3. You can go to any level, live forever, jump higher, make your own effects, and get radical firepower. <laughs> go to any level, jump higher, stay bigger, live forever, Game Genie, the radical video game enhancer.
So this is Castlevania from Konami. I I personally love this title. This was one of my favorite series back in the day. So we talk about Konami. Here's one of the games that solidified them on the home market. And unlike a lot of the other games that we've looked at so far, this was not an arcade game. Uh, this was a home game exclusively. So this set a new standard. This was uh, kind of their take on the platforming genre that had come about because of Super Mario Brothers, but with a much darker tone. And you get a whip. Anything with a whip is at least like three to five percent cooler. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da. Got some catchy music. Uh, I was just mentioning Indiana Jones. Ah, since you mentioned a whip. Ah, fair enough. Because I'm in Indiana Jones fever mode lately. Because <laughs> of the new movie coming out. Ray went to Egypt recently and caught a flu. <laughs> yes. Trying to find the remnants of... Of the original filming of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, anyway. the, George Lucas has a director's cut somewhere. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just killing stuff to kill stuff. Now, now. another cool thing with this game uh, that we mentioned there was a gameplay aesthetic in Super Mario Brothers is the hidden paths and items and walls and such. So there's a lot of different areas that you can uh, explore uh, by pouring holy water on them or smashing through them, such as right there. You find some meat that will heal some health that you don't know that that's there unless you just randomly hit that wall with your whip. So, these games offered a lot of exploration that wasn't available in earlier consoles. Now, the main, the big thing I like about this game is multi-tiered levels. Yes. The, how it's not just straightforward, it's up and down, like you're completely exploring a castle. Yeah. And I love that feeling in the game, where it feels like you're going through it, instead of just around it. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of exploration, a lot of backtracking which would become synonymous with later Castlevania games and uh, we're looking at Castlevania 1 here Castlevania 2 for the NES was a radical departure from this game and played almost like an action RPG there was a lot of uh, a lot of fetch quests that you had to do and item collecting and it was a really interesting title <coughs> and it was way different and then Castlevania 3 was essentially like this, and as was every other Castlevania game, they pretty much followed this mold. Uh, Castlevania 2 was kind of the dark horse and was radically different, and Ray tore that shit up. Yeah, notice that until I got to the bat, I didn't take any damage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love Castlevania. <laughs> Ray Except like... for the f***ing Medusa heads. Oh, those are nasty. Those... Medusa heads are definitely treacherous. Here we see the map world again. Now, mentioning iconic characters, those Medusa heads are also remembered as some of the most evil characters ever created. Yeah, ev oh yeah, uh, you mentioned the Medusa heads to a gamer and they will cringe. <laughs> Anytime you run into a Medusa head, it's never a pleasurable experience. Same thing with Ninja Gaiden birds. Yeah. Those were evil too. <laughs> and as far as iconic characters... Uh, the Castlevania series has created its own lore, um, and uh, with each uh, game, it follows the family line of the Belmonts. So, uh, each game is a different family member in the Belmont line that is trying to kill Dracula, and there's been probably, <laughs> what, close to two dozen uh, yeah. Castlevania games by now? Yeah, there has been a bunch of them, especially since they started pumping them out after the GBA took off. Yeah, they've been on virtually every console, but they were born and bred. Oh, These here heads. they are. Uh, but the Castlevania series was born and bred on the NES. So there's the Medusa heads that, that we were cringing about a, mi a minute ago, because they're very unpredictable. Thankfully, but, because I've mastered this game. <laughs> but this, ga this game isn't unpredictable like ghosts and goblins that we looked at last level. That's just un unrelenting. This is a lot more about uh, timed jumping. <laughs> Speaking of which... <laughs>
<laughs> you have to time your jumps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as you see, since he died, he lost his cool whip. There he gets a better one. So you can level up your weapons in this game, but once you die, you lose those power-ups. Yeah, which really sucks if you die right before you go into a boss, by the way. <laughs> and you always get your uh, a second power-up, which there you got a little sword, which you have a limited use of. Yeah, but you can see, I'll use it right there. But they're usually uh, a little more effective than your whip, or it can be used in specific areas. Like the axe I was using against the bat in the first level. You you find the secret strategies, and a lot of the bosses have a weakness to one certain special weapon. Yeah, so once you know the levels, you'll try and uh, get the specific secondary weapon that you're going to need for that level. And so if you see you know, one that you don't need, you won't pick it up. So this game brought a lot to the table, and uh, really put Konami onto the map for the most part. I mean, ha before Castlevania, what other games were Konami known for was space shooters. Yeah, and it proved Frogger. that they could branch out. Yeah. Yeah, this was definitely a home game. This was made for the home system, and was a great design. It was, as I said, essentially. Ha. Wow, that was, that was neat. I cheated. Yeah, that was neat. it was essentially, uh, you know, the same design as Super Mario Brothers, but it plays very well, and we'd see a lot of that. Super Mario Brothers found a great balance, and so every game developer came up with their version of that, and we're gonna look at a lot of those versions as we go here today. And you were crushed. Yes. Well, so, an awesome game again. Let's move on to a tubular game. Very tubular. All right, everybody. Let's take a look at um, an Ultra Games classic, Skate or Die. So let's talk about who Ultra Games is. Ultra Games. Also known as. Ultra Games actually is a subsidiary of Konami. They created the Ultra Games license due to um, Nintendo's uh, you can only make five games per year policy. Yes, Nintendo uh, wanted to control the flow of games released on their system, I guess is quality control, to say <laughs> that, you know... Your energy we, drink is bubbling. My energy drink it seems to be running over on itself, and I don't know why that is. can't be healthy, but <laughs> it's double caffe caffeinated, so it's got to be good. How do you just start now? <clears throat> so, let's go compete. Let's go compete. So, uh, the companies created uh, subsidiaries that were wholly owned by the original company, but it allowed them to get around Nintendo's only five games per year policy by uh, by having a separate company releasing them. Yeah. And over time, they, Nintendo would let loose on that a little bit, especially once Sega came along and let companies do what they wanted. Because yeah. uh, a, a company like Electronic Arts came along and wanted to do sports games for every system. And every sport. And if you limit them to five, that's all they were doing was sports games. All they, they couldn't were, really branch out. Yeah, they couldn't do any other types of titles, and they couldn't do anything else. And I can't remember how to get speed on this game. Boy, I sucked. Well, that wasn't too, that wasn't too bad. So here's our next skater, Ray. Oh... So, this was a really cool skating game, and speaking of Electronic Arts, uh, I see Electronic Arts' name was on this, it was also licensed by Konami because of Ultra, and uh, so I'm not sure, I'm guessing Electronic Arts actually developed this and maybe it was published by Ultra. Well, see, um, what happened was this was uh, actually the arcade version of Skate or Die was, uh, I believe, Midway, Williams, Atari Games, that whole sect of uh, game developers. So maybe EA bought those rights or was part of that. So there was like a very jaded history on that. 
more than is probably necessary. <laughs> oh, I don't remember how to get speed. That's because it's not you. <laughs> oh, okay. Ray doesn't either. Uh, no. <laughs> Crap. Uh, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Yeah, I don't think the Konami code works on this one. It is a Konami game. Um. Yeah. <laughs> okay, come on. I failed. Just stop. Come on, let your inertia stop you. <laughs> stop! Oh. It's like Wheel of Fortune. Stop, 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 stop. I want the watch. Uh, bankrupt. <laughs> Not the trip to Aruba. Let's... Come on. Press left and right, maybe. Maybe that's what Left, right. Oh, I saw a shift of momentum. Now go the other way. Oh. Come on, Ray. Let's go, Ray. <laughs> I don't think it's going to let us progress until you make this jump. All right. So, <laughs> let's try a different event. If the you joust. press start, select, then start, you quit. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> now, in this game, in this... Uh, Which one am I? You're the one without the paddle, I believe. Oh, am I? But I'm not certain about that. So what you gotta try and do here is knock your opponent off of uh, of their skateboard. Wow, that is really crazy pseudo 3D there. Yeah, isn't that slick? It's all <laughs> about perspective, baby. And again, I can't remember how to do anything in this game. I can't remember how to swing that stupid paddle. Oh! Ugh. I missed. I think I'm the black haired dude. Right. <laughs> yes, you are the black-haired dude, Ray. <laughs> oh, let's see. Oh, oh, the, you're the one with the blue. I didn't even know. The red pants. I'm red pants. Okay, you're red pants. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm blue pants. So we've pants. established who we are. <laughs> yeah, we might just cut this event and the high jump out. We'll go with the uh, the downhill. Boy, this is fun. In <laughs> true. <laughs> oh, we're all tied up. In that, a, this is part of the challenge. In a battle of attrition, who <laughs> will win? The guy who's not sure who he is, or the other guy who's just pressing buttons? I'm going to go with the guy that's pressing buttons, because I am so pressing buttons right now. I'm not sure who I am. <laughs> Remember, your red pants. Yeah, I know, but he's still not responding the way I want him to. Oh! Oh! That banana cakes. That might seal the victory for me. I time to play some might. time oh. to play some defense. Oh, or wipe you out again. And that is it. Game and over. Run with the win. If you get a two point lead, you win that event. So we're skating back to the skate shop. Let's go down to the jam. The jam. And, and we're gonna close it out with the jam. The jam. Oh, this is where it gets intense. This is for everything. Winner takes it all. Oh, if I can get my uh, bearings down. Uh, my skater's still a little drunk from the other night. Which one am I? Again, I'm not sure. I think I'm blue pants. Yep, I'm definitely blue pants. Alright, oh. now we're rocking. <laughs> I thought I was blue Once pants. Once you establish who you are in this game, you do a lot better. Oh, wrong turn. Go, blue pants. Come on, blue. I'm going to call my guy Scruff. Now these... Oh. Ooh. Oh, we got... Um. Oh, we, <laughs> those metal fences are deadly. Apparently very deadly. I got shredded. Oh, and here's the end, the best part. Ha ha. Oh. Oh, I was going to jump the police car, but I didn't have the speed. All right. Wait. I was blue pants. <laughs> I don't know, but I won. Whoa. Wait a minute. I think I might have put in your name, and you might have put in mine. No, we didn't do that. I'm <laughs> controller one. 
I don't know. That, I oh, I see. Maybe we did. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. Well, that was confusing. Okay. But the best part of this game is if you talk to this uh, snarky uh, skateboard uh, salesman guy, he says things like, "What are you staring at?" Semper fi or die. Apparently, he was a marine at one point in his life. Uh, someday you might be on a poster. I keep only the best high scores. Which, oh, look who's in the high score lists. Ray and Ron. We yeah, must we be the rock. best players ever. All right, so that's Skate or Die. Let's move on to one of the best seminal games of all time. Ooh. Ah. It's what have we here? The Legend of Zelda. Probably the most... Uh, probably the greatest game on the NES. I don't know. <laughs> Arguably the best game of all time. Yeah? One of the most innovative. Here's your basic story. The worst story ever. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Go ahead and pause the video and read that if you'd like. It it makes no sense. <laughs> but it doesn't need to because the gameplay holds up. It's It was poorly translated. But we see here the weapons. So let's go ahead and hop into this game. Okay. I was just wanting to get down to the... Um, oh, what one was it? The ladder or something. One of them just didn't make sense at all. But hey. Wow, we have someone that cleared the game. So do we want to start from the end or the beginning? <laughs> the end? This is a fully maxed out character. With... He doesn't have, have everything, the Triforce? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have all the Triforce, but he does have all the hearts. Okay. So, so uh... Well, let's go get the tri Let's go get a Triforce. Now this is a gorgeous game for the NES and uh, a huge world for at the time because there was no overworld map as in some of the other RPGs where you just moved a basic character around you could traverse the entire world map which if you look in the upper left corner that little square is Link in his uh, relation to the entire world map So you step into each square and each uh, screen. And it's really cleverly designed. There's a lot of puzzles, hidden items. And we go back to Shigeru, Shigeru Miyamoto's uh, messing with the boundaries of reality. So here there's a lot more hidden items. There's uh, things you have to randomly bomb to try and find items. You saw the stopwatch there that will literally freeze your enemies in time, uh, allowing you to attack them and uh, beat them. Just a lot of crazy things and... very A lot of creative thinking in this game. A lot of creative thinking, a lot of creative puzzle solving. Uh, the dungeons aren't just a matter of killing the big boss. You've got to figure out how to get to the big boss. Exhaust your mind that way. Go, and it's when you play this game originally, it is a grueling experience to get through those dungeons, and you're tired by the time you get down to that boss. It's 5 a.m. You've got five maps drawn out, laid out on the floor, trying to figure out where the hell that secret doorway is. <laughs> Thank God you have a save file. <laughs> and Yes, and you finally get to the bottom of the dungeon, and you get that Triforce, and it's a very... Uh, Rewarding, uh, rewarding experience. Rewarding experience. It's a very rewarding game. Very challenging, but rewarding and very well designed. Anyone that ever beat this back in the day without the guide, you know, props up to you, man. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a lot of ingenuity and just trying everything. And as you can see, we are refilling our life here. So now we can really kick ass. Now we have the f sword we can fire. And Definitely an awesome weapon. And as I can see, this is a later one, so he has the magical sword. This was a, a take on the RPG genre. Um, Shigeru Miyamoto wanted to make a game that was an epic adventure, but not an RPG. So he took some of the elements and 
made this. Instead of turn-based battling, it's real time. Uh, you have the heart system rather than a traditional experience point system. And something else interesting about this game was when he decided to create it, he um, thought of um, exploring caves as a young kid. Like he would explore caves in his youth, and he put that experience into this game. Yeah, it's the uh, the the wonderment and uh, fun of exploring as a child, and that's that's what he tried to capture with this. That you never know what's going to be around the next corner because you're making up in your mind what might be around the next corner, and this guy just thinks that way. Yeah, I was assuming this dungeon was done, but this is the level two dungeon. Does he not have this beat? He doesn't have the map. Well. Well. <laughs> all right. Okay. We're gonna beat level two. <laughs> even Interesting. Though the, even though the characters most of the way through the game, level two is a hard one to find, though. Maybe he just missed it. Uh, possibly. It's, it's in an out of the way place, and I have skipped a level three before and beaten it. Yeah, you don't or have at to. At least gotten to where he is. And yet another interesting aspect of this game, it's very open-ended. You uh, don't have to do them in order. You don't have to do them in order. There's different paths you can take and different ways you can explore the world. No player will play through the game exactly the same. And that was something also different and also radically different from a lot of the RPGs where they may have you know, quests here or there that you go back through different areas. But you literally have to cross the world map on this time and, and again back and forth to get everything you need. And this dungeon is going to be ridiculously easy with this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to tear through this uh, because the character by this point is... <laughs> At Ganon beating status. <laughs> yeah, he's fully maxed out with his life. How is that? That's... I guess maybe, you know, you can... I think you get the stepladder and... Isn't it? I bet he game genied this. <laughs> uh, that's a possibility. Because how could we... We not... He can't get another heart. If you beat this, you can't get another heart container. Oh, that's weird. And there's a Triforce there. Yeah. Well, we didn't game genie it, so... Yeah, th this... Uh... Well, we're Fun at time it. to mention the game Genie. <laughs> now this is a great time to mention shop.newgengamers.com because this game is currently for sale and we have uh, multiple copies of this game currently. And uh, so this is an, a copy that, that we have for sale and we just popped in here and, uh, and apparently he used the game Genie to get everything and then beat the game at his own pace. I guess. Well. Which would also explain why our key is at A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be true as well. There's the heart container we Not can't Not that use. we need it. And we'll go collect that piece of the Triforce that he left behind. So, we're just going to say that cheaters never win and losers use drugs. And so... This is not a properly played game of Legend of Zelda. No, this is cheating. So... I don't feel right. W we feel very dirty now. This this isn't natural. We've uh, we've cheated at one of the best games of all time, and you really can't enjoy it at that level. Actually, no, I haven't cheated at it. You... I just opened up a file that somebody else had cheated on. Oh, well, you're enabling the cheat. I say we close it out with this and come back to more Zelda action with Zelda 2. That which sounds I don't like a great idea. Which I don't think is Game Genied, and we have an extensive look at this on our uh, video areas already. We did a Ray's Retro review of it, so if you want to see more specifically on this game, check Where we it beat out. the first dungeon we without the Game Genie. Yes, <laughs> we naturally beat the game without all, right. all the power-ups. So? So there's a ridiculously powered-up version of The Legend of Zelda. Okay, so we're back. Now, uh, we discussed the Game Genie. The Game Genie was a, uh, a peripheral created by Codemasters, who was a uh, British developer. And 
they didn't want to license games from Nintendo for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. So they released their own unlicensed cartridges and made their own uh, uh, techniques to Ow. override the lockout chip that was built into the Nintendo Entertainment System. The NES had a lockout chip uh, that would have to communicate with the cartridges. So the cartridges would have to get a signal from the system and then it would give a code from a chip built onto the cartridge that would then allow the game to boot up. Companies like uh, Codemasters and some other ones uh, basically shocked the chip and fooled it into thinking that the game was okay and let it run. Which is not good for your system, by the way. Not good for your system, and so uh, they did this with the Game Genie and some other uh, of their unlicensed games, such as Micro Machines and, uh, and some other not so well-known and not very good games. But Codemasters has been prolific and been around for a lot of years. So they released the Game Genie peripheral, again unlicensed ah. by Nintendo. And what it did was it would hack the game code and basically cheat. It would give you unlimited lives, it would let you jump extra high, all sorts of different things that it would uh, take the existing parameters that were in the NES game and basically change the modifiers and allow you to completely power up your character. Such as in our Zelda video there, he had unlimited keys, he had all the hearts, pretty much all the items, you know, whatever you want. And so Nintendo did not like a device like this existing because, in their opinion, it, it killed replayability because you could just cheat through their game. I feel it adds some replayability. In games know, like Contra. In games <laughs> that are really difficult or just to play through them in that different way. You know, it's kind of fun. But uh, the Game Genie was the first example of that. We'd later see the Game Shark, the Pro Action Replay, etc., etc., on all the different consoles. But uh, Codemasters were the first to do that. And they were kind of a rebellious, cocky young group uh, with a name like Codemasters. And, uh, you know, they just didn't care about the licensing and just did their own thing. They released a a peripheral called the Aladdin for the NES, which was uh, a cartridge that you plugged cartridges into, so you had to have that, and then you got additional games for the Aladdin system. So they had their Game Genie and the Aladdin released under the the name Comerica, but it was Codemasters. So there's Codemasters. They're still around, and they still make some pretty good games, but they've had... Uh, you are Some, freaking uh, tearing it up, by the way. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> this is an unrelenting Capcom game, 1942, and Ron just completely tore it up there. Yeah, I was just running my mouth and trying not to pay attention, and it was working. <laughs> so, this game, let's talk about this game some, then. Oh, this is one of their fantastic early works at Capcom here. It was a, it was a forward vertical shooter, which... Um, as most shooter fans of um, this genre have come to accept, is the better ver better type of um, shooter is the vertical shooter instead of the side scroller. Yeah, I'd say so. I I like it. It feels like you're moving more forward than just side to side. It feels like you have more fluid motion. And the vertical. Oh, shouldn't have went for it. Vertical shooters are seen as more of like the. Um, I don't know, the refined ones. <clears throat> so this was, of course, called 1942, released by a Japanese company. Now, for anyone who's familiar with Japanese or American history or world history, around this time there was a world war going on. <laughs> and around this time, Japan and America were battling fiercely. And so uh, it's kind of interesting that that they released this game from a Japanese company in America. Kind of makes you wonder who, what side you're playing on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure if we're Japanese killing Americans or Americans killing Japanese. Maybe we're... Maybe we're killing Germans. Maybe we're Nazis killing Europeans. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
We're not really sure. It has sure. a very Pacific feel to it, though. We're not really sure, but we're we're causing some sort of great uh, genocide in American or in some sort of culture's history here. So yeah, we're killing a lot of fire pilots. But this was different than uh, most of the impending space doom shooters that were popular at the time. This is uh, this... a little more contemporary, and the sound is very loud. And so, yeah, the the arcade sound didn't get ported too well. Yeah, the it's just kind of a <laughs> noise. But you know, for what the the graphics are pushing here, um, maybe they just took a lot of room with the oh crap, with the um the graphic engine. And this was an early one, so maybe they hadn't perfected the sound chips for the yeah. NES like they did with Mega Man. Yeah, this was an early uh, NES game, and as far as the NES goes, it was released in 1983 in uh, in Japan, 1985 in America. Yep, Chris. And uh, released as the Famicom in Japan, which stood for the Family Computer, and they changed the name and changed the the exterior design of the system and the controllers and the cartridges for the uh, American version. Now, um, I'm going to throw in and mention here why they changed the design of the console. Do it. The reason they Do went it as for we... more of the... Oh, okay, we still have another life. Last life. Do I have... Yeah. Kill those Nazis. The reason that they changed the design of the console was so that it didn't look like a traditional game machine because of the recent crash that had just happened in the industry and Nintendo uh, in America was, yeah in America and Nintendo was trying to enter into the American market and retailers would not touch video game machines at that time so what Nintendo had to do was basically do some clever marketing what they did was they uh, changed the design to more of like a box like you know without the cartridge port sticking out and they called it the Nintendo Entertainment System, and they included um, with that the, sleek '80s semi-metallic looking styling. And they included the, you know, the control pads. They included the um, zapper, the the original zapper, and then they included and motherfucker. Our game just messed up, so. I think that was a good look at 1942, and we'll continue on with that story. Right here. All right, welcome back. Uh, after our little snafu with 1942, there. Here we have Mega Man 2. Also from Capcom. Yes, this one isn't quite as um, evil as. 1942 and Ghosts and Goblins and some of the early era no, stuff. No, it does have evil robots that are trying to take over. That's pretty evil. Yeah, it but just... it's not... Mega Man just seems happier. Yes. And this music is awesome. Dun, 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 now this is being played on the Mega Man Anniversary Collection on the Nintendo GameCube, but it is a uh, straight, straight port, port of the Nintendo Entertainment System game. <clears throat> so it is the same game. Yeah, we did try, we found as many of the uh, original cartridges as we could, but some we just had to, um, we had to get in here, so we had to find another way to do it. Yeah, so we have some virtual console titles for the Wii, and this is on the uh, GameCube collection. And this is an evil stage. <laughs> you want to say this game's not evil? Oh no, I love this. <laughs> I guess I just love this game. Oh, I love it. It's just, it's tough. Okay, uh, I scratched that evil remark. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's it's tough. It's fun and very challenging. Now, this was a departure from Konami or from Capcom's other games. This was uh, built to be a Nintendo Entertainment System home game and this was Kaiji Inafune's game and the game that would put him on the video game industry map 
uh, he was a young guy that was an artist and uh, worked at Capcom and was assigned a task of creating a game and some characters and so he came up with the character Rockman who was a robot who lived in a robot world not to be confused with just um, like a stone man but rock and roll is yeah. what the theme was yes it was set in a to be a rock and roll theme so all the music is uh, very good <laughs> very good for the for the system's capabilities and it has really great game design it's a platform action game and you uh, jump along the different platforms and try and defeat your enemies gain power-ups and at the end of each level you fight a robot boss who will grant you a weapon if you beat them when well, not grant you you take it from them yeah <laughs> and, uh, and then you have the power-up that they used which you each, can use to defeat other bosses. Yes, each each boss has a weakness to a particular weapon from one of the other bosses. So if you know the order, you can defeat the bosses rather easily uh, by going through the, ga the game through the right order. So now, that that is another thing that uh, Mega Man, the Mega Man series, added to uh, games is non-linear design. Where you could choose which section of the the game world you wanted to start in. Yeah, you pick the level that you do and could do them in any order. And added that element of strategy to it. And also replayability because you weren't forced to play through the same level every time you died. If you kept dying on a certain level, you could try a different one for a little bit and maybe figure it out. Here I'm fighting Flash Man. Yeah, he's kind of a douche. Yeah, he's also one of the easiest bosses to beat. He usually most one most uh, perfect orders go. Flashman is one of the first ones you beat. Wipe him out. It's either that or Crash Man. It's kind of your choice. And I love that music right there. So the power up one. Oh, look at that. Oh, a message from Doctor Light. That was really excitable, we're on. <laughs> I love Dr. Light. What can I say? Look how happy and nice he is. You get item three. So, Dr. Light created Mega Man. His arch nemesis is the evil, sinister Dr. Wily, who has a curled up, evil, thin looking mustache, and he's also bald, which is probably why he's such a dick. <laughs> um, I'd agree with that. <laughs> so, that's your protagonists. And this game runs off a password system, which a lot of NES games did. But the NES also introduced the battery-backed save feature for the home consoles. So some games would have a small lithium battery built into the cartridge that would allow you to save the game. Like and Legend of Zelda and uh, its sequel. Yeah, Legend of Zelda was a famous one, uh, Final Fantasy, and some of the others. That would not have been possible uh, to obviously play through the games. And the password systems would have been probably, you know... So complicated. Very complex for that much information. So uh, it became a good choice. Didn't add anything extra to the cost for consumers. And uh, <clears throat> added a lot to the flexibility of game design. So this game uses a password feature, so... Uh, which makes sense because all it needs to remember is what levels you've beaten, what bosses you've beaten, and what items you've gained. Yeah, I mean, it's rather simple. Whereas, you know, something like Final Fantasy needs to remember exactly how many experience points you have, which bosses you've beat, which dungeons you've gone in, how much gold you have, every specific item. A lot of different information. And the lithium batteries uh, held up for so long you know, some of them are still good to this day, and in fact, most of them are. Yeah, they they don't tend to um, go out. Those early ones were really, really solid. And so, oftentimes, you can take a uh, classic game that you've had for 20 years and, and still have the same game saved on it, which is remarkable. And I'm surprised that... Um, you know, more games didn't try to utilize that, but you would see that more in like the Super Nintendo Genesis era, where uh, game save 
uh, batteries became a lot more common. Well, I imagine it was a cost that was incurred by Nintendo, because another thing we haven't uh, quite gotten into with uh, Nintendo's licensing was not only did they require that that uh, they allowed you to make a game for them, they had to make the game cartridge. Everything had to be done in their hands, uh, so <clears throat> they had to provide the batteries, of course. So you know they probably added that into the the royalty costs for the third parties. So maybe some c companies viewed this as a cost that they didn't want to add to their overhead. You know, if you're doing a simple board game adaptation, you don't need a, a battery. So, uh, I'm sure cost came into play there. If you can remember his pattern, you can beat him pretty easily. Sometimes he's a little erratic with it, but just kind of follow the flow of the conveyor belt. I will do that. Oh, that's just a tip to the viewer there. <laughs> I'm a viewer. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Now, I'll try to get through this without using the energy thing, but if I get too low here, I'm going to uh, pop it since I got two of them, and uh, there's no point in me not using them since we're not going to the end here. That's right. <laughs> yeah, if you get too close to him, you'll start jumping around, so if you keep your distance... Well, you can also play that on him, too, because if you get him jumping too much, he won't be able to hit you with anything. And that's another thing. All the bosses had different strategies. If you didn't have the right weapon to use, you know, you'd have to figure out the right strategy to, to beat them. And a lot of times, they were really tough if you didn't have the right weapon. But if you had the right weapon, it was like four or five hits on some of them. Yeah. And that's, like, ridiculous level. Well, I think we've taken a pretty good look at Mega Man here. Mega Man 2, Mega Man series, you know. Yes, this is uh, the second one, a aesthetic and um, slight improvement over the original. Better graphics, better level design, bigger levels, bigger bosses. It upped it all, more bosses. Uh, so definitely better than the original. And I'm going to say out of the series, the best of them out of the original NES version because there were six built off the same game engine from the original Mega Man. I'm going to stick with number two as the yeah, best. Two Ray. would definitely be my choice for the best one. Three comes a pretty close, but, you know, it just... Two had that something extra. So, commenters, what do you guys think? What's the best Mega Man? I'm going to say we're going to get a lot of twos and threes. That's what I'm thinking. Four, once you saw Skull Man and Pharaoh Man, it just it got weak. Yeah, four was bad. <laughs> I, I kind of liked five, but it the enemies got too weak They there. should have had Hamburger Man. I think that would have been a cool one. And that might have been in the X series. And, and another, <laughs> another quick side note with Mega Man, they once had a contest in Nintendo Power to uh, let a reader pick the next Mega Man boss. So, and I think they actually picked a couple. Night Man was one of them. They also had one where you could design the enemies for Mega Man 2. They okay. had a couple different contests. So uh, that shows the level of interaction that uh, I'm going to call him punk rock game designer Kaiji Inafune brings to the table because, you know, that kind of interaction was rarely seen, and especially from a Japanese company to offer that to Americans. So really cool. Mega Man, thumbs up. They should put him in Smash Brothers. Damn right. <laughs> Just, I don't know why I threw that out there, but... Welcome back, everybody. We are playing Gradius today. Trying to put in the Konami code. <laughs> On the virtual console, and I don't know that it can be done, so we're just going to say screw it. But we wanted to mention the Konami code because uh, this was the game that it was originally accidentally left in as a uh, way for the developer to test the bugs in the game and to jump around in the levels and uh, not get killed. And it was a cheat code that became famous and was then later used as a novelty in other uh, Konami games. And a survival device in Contra. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> many gamers fathom that uh, Konami intentionally uh, made Contra so difficult, or at least 
left your lives so low so that you'd use the Konami code. I don't know if that's true or not, or if they just made it ridiculously hard. Uh, it was ridiculously hard. <laughs> either that we way, cannot doubt. Even, even with 30 lives, it was hard. So this is an awesome shooter where you can get power-ups, and uh, so as you go along, you try and get the various power-ups without dying, which let you kill more effectively here. I've got the laser. The laser. Now. And so this is another stellar third-party effort <clears throat> that was only available uh, at home on the Nintendo Entertainment System. And Konami was just fantastic with these. Yeah, and, and we, we didn't see this on Atari, we didn't see this on Master System, only on Nintendo. Yeah, you'll you'll hear that a lot during this, only on Nintendo. Yeah, most of the Some titles... Some genres were... Maybe I need that code. Most of the <laughs> titles uh, we'll be looking at today were only available on the Nintendo Entertainment System, and they pretty much secured all the third parties for the home market during their reign. Yeah, that was a kind of a major part of their um, their strategy was getting all the third parties to make games just for them, which um, we'd find out later that were um, just shady business practices. Yeah, it was a kind of a strong arm tactic, but at the same time, it was quality control. You know, if you look at it from that aspect, they didn't want just anyone making anything for on their system. They wanted it represented a certain way. They wanted family-oriented titles. They didn't want blood. They didn't want gore. And so they, they were... They didn't want the porno titles that were on freaking 2600. Yeah, I think that was a big thing, too. That was part of it. They didn't want the black eyes that the industry got because of those things. And they wanted anyone to be able to play their games. They wanted to be a family-oriented company. So they were very stringent on what was released and, and what was... Uh, to be released and there was a lot of stuff that um, was available on the Famicom in Japan that um, either got edited out or just didn't make it over here was something else that I noticed was they were really stringent on stuff that actually crossed the border too yeah yeah they would change certain things uh, between releases um, or release completely separate games like uh, an upcoming title we're going to look at here, Super Mario 2. Yeah. I mean, they released a whole separate version of that game. Japan saw so many more releases than America. There were so many games that never came to America, um, you know, that were out there, and that one was one, and I don't know why they changed it, but... Well, you ever played Super Mario The Lost Levels? Yes. Because it was so freaking hard. Like that part of this game. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, pretty rough. Now, uh, a fun side note for this series is, uh, you know, they've had several Gradius titles, and uh, as you said, Konami uh, had a stellar line of these side-scrolling shooters, and they parodied their own series with. Uh, I assume it was an arcade and also a Super Nintendo game called Parodius as a play on Gradius and also using the word parody, you know. And so, yeah, I'd say we have a good look on this. In the game Parodius, uh, it, 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 ha it was Gradius except there was just all these weird Konami characters and just odd characters in, instead of these ships and different things. I mean, yeah, they they just basically spaceballed it. <laughs> yeah, their own title. They just kind of uh, lampooned it, and it was kind of interesting. Not very well known. So if you can ever check that out, do so. If you like Konami shooters, so this is our look at uh, Gradius. So yeah, let's move on. All right.
six great issues plus six free strategy guides on a hot new game. That's twice the power for still 15 bucks. Wow. Call now. Did you see the latest Nintendo newsletter? Whoa, nice graphics. I'd like to get my hands on that game. You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. It's the Legend of Zelda, and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ghana are pretty bad. Octorox Tech Tech's levers, too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah, go, Link. Yeah, get some. Awesome. Intense. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. The Legend of Zelda. Good night, Mom. <laughs> Feels so in Toys R Us store. Every toy I ever dreamed of was 18,000 more. If your child is dreaming about Nintendo, the control deck with bonus game pack is only 79.97 at Toys R Us. Satellite gun just 19.99. Game cartridges from 29.99 each at Toys R Us. I jumped. I won the Super Bowl. I had a better dream. Toys R Us. You'll never outgrow. <laughs> まだ懲りないドクターワイリーの野望。グレードアップした8ステージの強敵ロボット。面白さ2倍。究極の通過アクションゲーム。ドッグマン2。ドクターワイリーの謎。What will the future bring from Nintendo? More hits like The Legend of Zelda. Sports hits like ice hockey. Nintendo has the most video game hits like Hogan's Alley and Donkey Kong Classics. And more like Excite Bike and RC Pro-Am. And you can play them only on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you're playing with power. <laughs> Alright everybody, welcome back to Console Wars of the Past here, we're doing the NES era. And here is another absolutely fantastic game for the NES. This is Punch-Out! Now this was originally an arcade title done by Nintendo that they retooled and released on the NES. Yeah, the arcade version actually looks a lot different. Way different, yeah. But both are really fun. And you see Mario playing the refere referee here. Now the thing that I always liked about this title was the the facial expressions and the visual cues they would give you on um, like the different patterns to do. Like right there, if you know when he comes down and does that little move, if you uppercut him, you can knock him down. So there's little tips and tricks. You're, the gameplay itself is pretty basic. You can move left and right. You can duck and dodge. And you can punch high and low, left and right. And then you get special star attacks, which do massive damage. And the Glass Joe, knock him the out. <laughs> so we'll plow through Glass Joe very quickly here. He's the... He's the, the wuss character. The, the character to get you familiarized with the game and get started, and you can just decimate him. See ya. You knock him down three times in one round, you get a technical knockout, like in real boxing. So, it, it plays similar to real boxing, but is very arcadey and over the top. All the characters are really memorable for what little bit of information you get this is all you get but these characters are very memorable just because of their movements and their reactions like von Kaiser. yeah this game is is really like watching a a comic book version of a of a video game and really almost stylized yeah they really put a lot of um stylistic detail into this game and uh, as you notice the little flash and the head bob there now, I think you probably know this, but if you get a star on him, you can just do a couple punches and then he'll get like a oh no look and then you can just knock him out. <laughs> and the strategies abound in this game. 
Now, another note on this. This was originally licensed to like have... Like that? Yeah, exactly, like that. Yeah, I'm a Punch-Out Master, man. Oh. The only one I couldn't beat was Mike Tyson, who I was just about to get to, has been... This is the Punch-Out version. Ray this... and, to, together, Ray and I have about tw uh, about 40 years of Punch-Out experience, so... <laughs> we are the experts on the subject. We've played a lot of Punch-Out. So, Mike Tyson was in the original release of this game, this, we're playing on the Wii Virtual Console, so the controller's a little harder to use. I definitely prefer the original NES controller, it, but uh, this does not have Mike Tyson. No, um, they had to re-release the game later on in 1990 after Mike Tyson got himself in trouble with a rape case, and, um, you know, he went to jail for a few years for that. Well, we talked about Nintendo liking to have a squeaky clean image. And right there... Mike Tyson did not fit the bill. Yeah, Mike Tyson kind of messed up the relationship there. So they took Mike Tyson out of the game, kept the design, and put in a... Mr. Dream. Mr. Dream, who... Basically they, kept Tyson's moveset, I believe. Yeah, the character sprite is Tyson. They just changed his face a little bit and made him white. Otherwise, it's pretty much Tyson. Yeah. Sandman's still tough as nails, though. Oh, this is always tough. Right in the, right in the gut. Right in the gut. <laughs> yeah, if you sock him right in the gut there, he goes down. <laughs> or you get a star, and then you really have to duck and move. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a pick and choose there. Whichever one they're going to give you that time. It really depends on the split second of your timing. As we said, we're discussing strategy here. <laughs> and that's what's so fun about this game, is you fight the same boxers every time, but, uh, you know, the battles are a little bit different every time. And you can do some different things. And they, you know, they each have their weaknesses in ways that you have to play through them. Yep, right in the gut. Nice. Down he goes. <laughs> yeah, that was always... And that ends the match. You won the world champion, or the... You won the championship. I the won minor a, title. I won a championship, but we're not done yet. Oh, yeah. We still have to do the uh, run in the park. <laughs> and little Mac, our main character, dresses in the gayest outfit ever in video game history. Well, real men wear pink, and if, you know... You want to start a fight with a boxer, you know, what way to spar than to wear a pink outfit? Someone's bound to pick a fight with you. I guess. <laughs> and you have the obese trainer, Doc, riding a bicycle and uh, having Mac chase after him. They're in New York. You get the beautiful New York skyline. And then we move into Don Flamenco from Spain, a Spaniard. Well, I always thought was the... I don't know. <laughs> the funniest looking character in the game. He's goofy. He's definitely a goofball. And he'll toy with you the entire match. That's the thing. If you can't get him to hook, then he'll he'll taunt you the entire match. But if you get this left, right, left, right, left, right combo down, he's done for. Yeah, this character, if you alternate your punches, will just stay in a volley and you can just knock him down perpetually. So some of the characters have ways that you can beat them very easily. Once you find the right solution. Like King Hippo. Who we will face next. Probably, I don't think he's getting back up. Let's hope not. If he knows what's good for him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's not getting back up. Oh, that's right, bitch. Stay down. <laughs> so we get the KO there because he just had enough. He didn't even come out. What was he thinking? Yes, we're ready for the next challenge. Come on. King Hippo, definitely one of the coolest characters from the game. And these characters, are again, are so memorable. And there was a follow-up uh, for Super Nintendo called Super Punch-Out. But the it characters... It had good mechanics, but the characters weren't as memorable. It wasn't as good, and the characters weren't quite as memorable. Now this guy, you've got to hit him whenever he opens his mouth. So you've got to kind of kind of watch and kind of guess when he's going to open his mouth. He tries to trick you. Once you 
hit him in the mouth. Then you just punch him in the stomach. On the Band-Aid. <laughs> knock him down. And he's done. He never gets back up. He'll never get back up if you knock him down once. And you have a limited number of punches that you can use in this one. So if you don't... You gotta be careful. Yeah, if you don't use your punches right, it's easy to lose. Now that's <coughs> the thing about this this game is, you know... Every, oh, before you knocked out King Hippo, I wanted to mention his little um, cameo on Captain N. Ah, uh, yes. We never did match in Captain N, the the uh, the NES Master. The... We did during the Super Nintendo one. Oh, we did? Okay. But mention him again. Well, Captain N was a series that was run during the NES days uh, by Nintendo. They created it. And um, it featured characters from the Nintendo worlds. And not very great representations of them. Now, uh, before it was a cartoon series, or actually it might have been as it, right along with it, but there was also a graphic novel comic book series uh, that was released for Captain N, Mario, and Zelda that all used kind of the same uh, art style. And I believe they had some other ones too. I used to have a whole bunch of them, which maybe I'll try and get those... Uh, I remember the Mario way. comics. I had some of those. I actually ha may have those in existence yet. I will hunt them down. Uh, so, Captain N was a cartoon and a comic book featuring the same characters and essentially the same storylines. But it had characters from lots of different games and lots of different game companies, which was what made it fun because they just kind of mixed them all into one video game universe. Oh, I hated this. Oh... Kabam. So, uh, who all was in that? There was the Mother Brain from Metroid. Uh, Eggplant Wizard from Kaid Icarus. Uh, they had... Oh, what was one of the other ones? There was like four main enemies. Was that the one Mega Man was in? Yeah. Okay, in Mega, Captain in. Mega yeah. Man was in it. Now here they ripped off uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, saying, they have dance like a fly, bite like a mosquito. Of course, Muhammad Ali had... Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yes. But still, a wonderful game. And he's going to do it again. Whoop! Oh, I jumped Careful the there. gun. <laughs> but once he does that punch, he's done for. But he'll keep getting up until... You basically have to pound the crap out of this guy. Yeah, he's he's tough. He tries to take you to a draw if you play through all three rounds. And uh, do you ever there's... win the decisions? Oh yeah, you can win them. Yeah, after three rounds are over, it goes to a judge's decision. Whoever had uh, you know the better performance will get the win. Kablam! Just stay down, you fool. There's nothing good to come of it. He's a fighter. So little Mac is, of course, the major underdog. He's 17 years old, fighting these massive super heavyweights, and he kicks their ass. That's right. So, that's Punch-Out. That was a great look at Punch-Out, and we're going to move on here to another great title, another great sports title. All right, everybody, welcome back. We're taking a look at Tecmo Bowl. Yeah. I love Tecmo Bowl. Now, this is one of the best two-player experiences on the Nintendo Entertainment System. So we're going to get down and gritty and old school. Oh, who's... Oh. I'm going to take... San Francisco. I'm going to take Los Angeles. Now, this Ooh. has the NFL Players Association license, but does not have the team licenses... So, the teams just have the cities. The subsequent Tecmo Bulls would have the actual teams, though. Yeah, Super Tecmo Super Bowl was the first one that had um, the actual teams. And they actually had all the plays and the players. And it was, like, fully licensed by the NFL. Yeah. Now, they had this uh, this series on the, 
the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo Son Entertainment a... System, and the Genesis. Very nice interception. And yeah, uh, for your side. <laughs> and uh, they have a new one coming out for the Nintendo DS. So keep your eyes open for that. Wow, you called that. Yeah. Um, you have Los Angeles. Of course you're going to run. <laughs> but you're not going to call it twice. Run, Bo, run. So I've got Bo Jackson here, who was just prolific at the time. Oh. Well, duh, it's third down. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to go for the punt. I hate punting, but... Never punt in Tech Mobile. Come on. <laughs> I know. I'm going for it, though. It's one of the unwritten rules of playing Tech Mobile. You never punt. It is, but I'm a seasoned veteran now, so I see the folly of my, my wild young ways, except when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's why All you right, don't we, punt. Yeah, we should have just went for it. And you'll see I'm, I have the 49ers, so I only have one real running play, so... Um, I'm mainly going to be passing here, except in this case. <laughs> until he breaks free into open field. Oh! And the juke and drive still works. Yes, the classic <laughs> zigzagging is the best tactic to escape uh, in this game when you're running. Oh, open again. I'm the 49ers, man. You can't stop me. This is not looking good. <laughs> And notice they don't have the player names in this one because this is the virtual console version. So they they had lost the right to the players at this point. Thank okay. you, EA. So yeah, so the original Nintendo Entertainment System version did have it. Did have the player this, names. This crappy Wii console version does not have the players, and that sucks. Well, uh, you know that's the best they could do to get it on the system, just because once again EA owns everything. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of unfortunate. Oh, come on, keep moving. Keep moving. Get him. Thank you. So, uh, again, this is a great um, multiplayer experience. And it, it was also an arcade game originally. And you'll sit here and trash talk your opponent, too. Oh! Oh, look at oh, that! Oh, not good. <laughs> that was not... Not what our team needed at that moment. So am I going to call my one run or my one of my many pass plays? Hmm. Or a screen. Oh. <laughs> the Niners were vicious during this period. Yes, they were. You've got Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, Roger, Roger Craig, Craig John Taylor. They were stacked. I think this was the year they went 15 and 1, too. Come on, Bo. All I've got is Bo Jackson. My whole team... And Marcus Allen, That's I'm banking on that, although Tim Brown was prolific. So you had a decent team, it's just... So in our other console war videos, we looked at Madden, which has become the gold standard of, of football games. But before there was Madden, there, there, was, was Tecmo. there was Tecmo, and Tecmo kicked ass. This was the first really great football game. We'd seen previous attempts from several companies. They were just slow and clunky. They were, Yeah, absolutely. They did not play well. And this is, uh, it was an arcade game, so, which a lot of those were too, but, uh, you know, this definitely played a lot better. Oh, did you notice the uh, Tecmo slid in their advertisements on the scoreboard <laughs> there? Yes. Rygar and Ninja. Yes. So check out Tecmo's other games Tecmo recommends. Oh, I can't believe he got that. Yeah, you got away with that one. <laughs> Keep playing the secondary here. Oh, that was to... Whoa! I was going to say that was to <laughs> no one, but... He caught it. It was to someone. So it's it's easy to really get into this game and uh, have fun with, with another player. Yeah, me and my cousin used to play this all the time. That was until Super Tecmo Super Bowl came out, and then we, you know, had our actual NFL teams, and we were just in our glory then. Cause yeah. Then you could choose your own playbook and everything. You choose your own playbooks, switch out players. There was injuries. There was statistics for the whole year. Definitely a major upgrade, and I love the ridiculous. Oh come on! Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love Completely the ridiculous runs. Me. And that's the great part of the arcadiness of the game. Like, you just do wacky crap like that, and it's a lot of fun. You know, it's not 
obviously a uh, perfect sim, but it's not trying to be either. Uh, sometimes you don't want to be a sim, you know? Oh, it's <laughs> tightening up. Until you kick the ball off. Ooh. Ooh. Ray's talking. Let's see if he can back it up. Let's get this extra point. Kablam. I thought he had him. <laughs> he was close. I thought you were going to try something crazy there. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> nah, not going for the onside kick yet. Oh. So Tecmo uh, became another major third party for Nintendo during this time with games like this, Rygar and Ninja Gaiden. Yeah, they had a lot of excellent franchises that came out of the NES. Good thing you caught up to me because your team wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I got a ridiculous burst of speed. Oh, straight to the... Re running back straight through the hole that's smash mouth football right there it's not looking good Boom. For, it's not <laughs> looking good for our raiders i'm uh i'm pretending to be john madden <laughs> boom the person that scores the most points wins the game they should equip him with headlights and a hard <laughs> <horn matters. laughs> what <laughs> Well, with headlights in a hard hat. <laughs> you should have known when I took the Niners. That was it. I always got to go with Bo Jackson. I put all my faith in Bo. But today was not his day. So we'll play out this quarter and... Call the mercy roll at halftime? Yep. <laughs> oh! Run! Run! Oh, all right. Even if I score a touchdown, it's not going to be enough. So we're going to go for the Hail Mary. Well, don't tell me you're going for the Hail Mary. Oh, I'm telling. I'm calling it. You're going to die. <laughs> Here it goes. Touchdown. Oh. No. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, get him. <laughs> All right. I'm like, touchdown? Well, maybe. <laughs> well, the Raiders suck and uh, lose again. And that was our Oh, and Tecmo also brings to the table titties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All that's right. enough of pixelized that's the. <laughs> that's America, baby. And that was Tecmo Bowl. All right, everybody, welcome back to Console Wars of the Past here, the NES era. We are doing Kid Icarus. One of the most challenging games on the uh, NES. Look how many enemies are stacked on top of each other there. That's not right. It's ridiculous. <laughs> now, this one was designed by R&D number one within Nintendo, which was Gunpei Yokoi and company. Who's also responsible for Metroid. Which we will be looking at here. Uh, so, we'll look at s some of his designs, which were a little bit different than uh, Nintendo's other stuff. A little bit darker, perhaps. And uh, they didn't play quite as fluidly, but still very good games. I, you know, I don't think they had the fluidity of the Super Mario Brothers and uh, other Miyamoto titles. But great designs. Oh, yeah. The, these games always make you think, You mother... F I gotta stop that. <laughs> 305. Uh, I've got enough for the goblet. We're gonna start thinking that the audience is having sex with your mother, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I refilled my health there after uh, this little run-through. <laughs> All right, which way are we going here? 
Wow, those things are ugly and nasty. And tricky. So this is a very challenging game. This is one of Nintendo's Dark Horse series, and it seems like all of Gunpei Yokoi's series kind of became uh, Dark Horse series for Nintendo that were kind of forgotten. Um, Yokoi designed all of these things, and he started with the company in 1965 as a maintenance man for the company, and uh, he created a little uh, graspy thing that you'd squeeze the handle and it would reach out and grab something. And president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, saw this little invention that this maintenance man had made and saw the potential that, uh, that this guy could maybe invent and create some cool things for the company. So, being the wise man that he was, uh, promoted Gu uh, Gunpei Yokoi into a you know, more of a white collar position with the company to more actually a designer. as a designer and an, as an engineer. So, you know, he had very humble beginnings with the company and I think they always kind of treated him that way though and didn't regard him as highly as say Shigeru Miyamoto who came to the company as an artist out of college and, uh, you know, came from more of an artistic angle where Yokoi was uh, mainly an engineer. Which is too bad because a lot of, you know, Miyamoto had some genius, but so did um, Yokoi. Yokoi invented handheld gaming. I mean, that's that alone that, is, is monumental. He invented. Oh, those octopuses are gotta <laughs> go. He invented the Game and Watch and the Game Boys, uh, which pretty much made up the handheld market for the last twenty plus years. And yeah, he eventually died in a uh, mysterious circumstance in a car wreck after leaving Nintendo and uh, starting his own company, which he went on to design the Wonder Swan uh, handheld system. So uh, Ray's, I think, going to have to give up on this game because he may have to <clears throat> smash his Wii if if uh, he has any more difficulty. So yeah. Okay. Okay, here's another uh, Nintendo sports game. Uh, let's do a two-player. Oh, yeah. My bad. You want to restart that? Yeah, we'll just go with it. We're playing this on the Wii Virtual Console. This is the last one we'll be taking a look at on the, uh, on the Virtual Console. We're going to switch back to our old trusty I'll go NES. I'll with which we gave a nice little rest to. Now here you pick fat guys or skinny guys, or middle-sized guys. So they all play differently, and uh, you can use different strategies that way. I'm going to use two fat guys and two skinny guys. I'm going to go with two medium guys, one fat guy, one skinny guy. <laughs> so let's see what we end up with here. This is a great uh, early hockey game, one of my favorites. And again, we've done a lot of hockey games in these series, so this is taking a look at another one. Oh! Uh, look where who's was my goalie? Not where he should have been. <laughs> so the skinny guy gets a score with that lightning speed. He just shot across the rink. And of course, the fat guys are big, so they knock guys down easier. As no, fat no, 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 no! <laughs> Whoops. As fat guys often do. Oh, come on! Pull the goalie! No offense to any fat guys that may be listening, but let's face it, you knock more people down than us little guys do. <laughs> <laughs> the so sad the, truth. So the little guys, of course, are faster. Because can, they can run. But they're prone to get knocked down ha! easier. Ooh, that was a nice save. I thought I had that one. Oh! Look and whose goalie wasn't where they were supposed know, to be! he wasn't paying attention. <laughs> he so, was drunk. So you control your goalie... Uh, and also one of your team members at the same time, so sometimes it's kind of tough to know who you're controlling. And I'm still... Pass it. Ugh. Oh, we had a little scuffle there. <laughs> oh, did you see that fat guy take him out? 
Oh, score! Sweden, Ooh. world's best. Nothing. Uh, bikini team. They have the loosest copyright rules in the world. I thought you were gonna say something else. The loosest <laughs> bikinis in the world. I didn't know where that was going, so uh, I didn't want to touch it. Actually, I didn't either. So, and it's better you didn't touch it. <laughs> oh. Shoot! Come on, skinny guy, run! Follow that fat guy. Fat guy! Oh! oh. Fat guy backhands it! Man! So, of course, you don't get any officially licensed players or anything of that sort here. You just no, you get, get fat guy and skinny guy. You just get your generic players for the different countries. But that's all you needed. This game plays so well, except whenever you're not getting your goalie where he needs to be. Yeah, I've had that problem four times now. <laughs> we'll go with the little guy for the face-off this time. He better win it. Nope. Uh, quit. I guess they should quit charging the net, huh? <laughs> oh. Oh, look at the save on that one. Yeah, that was slick. <laughs> My fat guy's just being a jerk. Oh, didn't have him where I needed to be. <laughs> Damn. Oh, the comeback is brewing. It is. This is tight. And since we're probably just doing a one-period run here. Yeah, we'll just play to the end of this one, so it's going to be an exciting last minute here. As the fat guys and the skinny guys bounce around. Who will it be? Sweden or America? Who is the greatest country? Playing a little bit of D there with my fat guy. Oh, oh! That is end of period as they all spin around in circles for some reason. Oh, well, looks like you got this one. Sweden wins again. All right. All right. So that's that ice hockey. High hockey. Another, <laughs> I thought I was going to sneak it in there. Another good sports game by Nintendo for the NES. Alright everybody, welcome back to Console Wars of the Past here. The NES era from NewGenGamers.com. And we are playing Super Sprint. Now this title is from the infamous Tengen. Who, um was one of the companies that refused to work with Nintendo as far as licensing goes and work their way around the lockout chip. Now, uh, Tension was an offshoot of Atari, so you have to almost wonder if uh, uh, their previous dealings with Nintendo led them to, to take that route. Yeah, since they already kind of had the idea of um, how the system works, because Originally, Nintendo went to Atari to sell their Famicom in the U.S. And Atari shut down the deal. Now, we don't know... I don't know that this is absolutely true, but... Supposedly, Tengen went to the patent office and claimed that they had a lawsuit going on with Nintendo, which they did not and that they needed documents describing how the lockout chip for Nintendo's system worked and got the documents and then created their own chip which they called the Rabbit which was identical to the Nintendo chip and the reason they did this was they didn't want to license them but they didn't want to, to uh, do what um, uh, Codemasters and some of the other unlicensed companies were doing which was Shocking the chip. Shock, shocking the chip and potentially potentially frying the system. So to get around that, they stole the plans of how to make the chip and made their own. So I guess Tengen went about it the, uh, um, I don't, I don't know how to say <laughs> it, but the, the best possible way to, if you're going to pirate something, at least be nice about it, I guess, <laughs> and not try and destroy the console. Well, I don't know what would be nice about stealing someone's patent from the patent office and then stealing that idea and copying it completely, that's violation of 
of the the patent laws. But, so everything they did was wrong. But instead of other companies <laughs> like frying the chips in the systems, pot causing possible damage to systems and or who knows how much how good the shock was. Yeah, as opposed to what uh, to what those companies were doing. Yeah, it was definitely safer for the systems. But as far as business dealings go, still shady. It's wrong. It's shady. <laughs> yes. But so is a lot of what what these companies have done over the years so you know that's just how it goes I guess and so Tengen tried this and Nintendo subsequently sued them in court over whether they could make games without uh, Nintendo's permission and you know these things went round and round and Nintendo fought for their rights to hold control over what games were released but and um I don't know. Did detention? They won one of those cases. Yeah, um, but they still weren't allowed to uh, to release the unlicensed game. So I'm not sure. There was something that they got allowed. It might have been involving that chip. I'm not sure, but. And they, Nintendo really got them back when it came to Tetris. But we'll get more into that when we get to Tetris. Yeah. So Tengen, uh was just a, a uh, part of Atari. And so they tried to release games on the competing system. They colored them black to look like the Atari systems. And uh, this game was done by Midway in the arcades, but they brought it home. They ported several titles for Midway, for Sega, and uh, some other companies, uh, Namco, uh, licensed games for all of them on the Nintendo Entertainment System, but did not license the rights from Nintendo to do so. So... Now here's an interesting point: was um, when Tengen was doing this, they had a competing system on the market, or Atari did. Yeah, they had the 7800 out there, and it was still, you know, in competitive market share. And so was the 2600, which was being released as a budget console at the time. So that shows you Nintendo's dominance. That Atari saw it. And the th other companies saw it as more feasible to work with Atari to publish their games on the Nintendo rather than on, say, the, the 7800. They didn't get this on the 7800. They didn't get Gauntlet. They didn't get Rolling Thunder. You know, Nintendo's system got those even though they were from Atari, published by Atari. Now, Atari got a couple of good ones. They got Clax and a couple of others for the 7800, but by the time that those games came out, Nintendo had so such a strong foothold in the market that it didn't even matter. No, the 7800 really was a non-competitor with the N Nintendo Entertainment System, and same with, uh, with the Master System. It really was not competed with because of those third-party games and because Nintendo's games were just so good. I mean, that that really was what did it, but the third-party support was cr crucial as well. Now, the di um, another thing with the 7800 was that it was actually supposed to be released in 84 uh, when the market crashed. So, it actually sat on the shelves for two years. Yeah, Atari crashed the market, and wouldn't you know it, after crashing the market, they decide... I don't know, maybe people don't want to have video game systems anymore. They don't seem to be buying them. After you crash the industry, you know, you it, it makes sense, that I guess, that maybe people don't want your shit. So they decided to go in a different direction and focus more on their computers, which is what a lot of the other American game companies were doing then. They all kind of abandoned it, and Nintendo came in from out of nowhere and, and swooped it all up. So let's talk about more of their dominance. Continuing on with our story here. Uh, Nintendo swept in and so Atari had this system ready shortly after the Famicom came out in Japan. But they didn't see the market as being sustainable. They thought the, the video game thing was done. People were bored with it. They didn't want them anymore. Not thinking it was because they released goddamn E.T. and Pac-Man <laughs> that were terrible on their machines as to why nobody wanted to pay any money for their games. You know, there were real reasons. And Nintendo came in 
and made sure that games were good and had a quality control level that was not there when Atari was there. Uh, and that's why also they wanted the licensing from all third parties. Uh, so they could make sure the quality of the game is what was up to their standards. And what was up to their standards meant that the game would not crash. The game didn't have bugs. You wouldn't be playing and all of a sudden bust through a wall and your character goes out into space never to return. And just weird glitches. You know, they wanted the games to be solid when they came out. And, uh, and that was really the main thing that they expected as well as uh, what the the content was yeah they didn't <clears throat> you know you didn't have to you know put a, a oh he's grabbed onto the vine <laughs> he sure did we didn't want him to grab onto the vine we want him to jump over the vine <laughs> we are taking a look now at Super Mario Brothers 2 this is the US release of Super Mario Brothers 2 for the NES and son of a yeah, so let's go into into the the chronology here. Okay, we had Donkey Kong, who introduced the character Jumpman. Then we had Mario Brothers for the arcade, which introduced Mario as well as his brother Luigi. Then we had Super Mario Brothers. And All that... of these games were released worldwide. Then we had Super Mario Brothers 2 in Japan. Which was basically a a retool and different level design of basically using the same engine as Super Mario Brothers One. Yeah, it had the same enemies, same characters, same background sprites. You know, it was basically a just a, an upgrade of of the existing game design. But that game was also extremely hard. Yeah, it was. Uh, we, ridiculous to at New Gen Gamers we've dubbed it Bowser's Revenge <laughs> because it is much harder than the original Super Mario Brothers to the point that you know only the hardest of hardcore like Ray here want to play through it in America you know it was perceived that it was going to be too hard for an American audience and so they did not release it in America they didn't think we would like it so I don't know what would have happened had they originally had they released it in America then, you know, if people would have caught on to it or not. Yeah, I really can't tell because it uh, d depends on the, the tastes of the players at the time. The game was never available in America until the Super Mario Brothers uh, All-Stars Collection. All Collection for the Super Nintendo, which if you watch our Super Nintendo Console Wars of the Past, uh, you can see us, well, you can see Ray that play one. that game. Uh, as you've seen him play every Mario game. And uh, so that was the first time we got to see it. So what they did to compensate for the huge American market that was fiending for another Mario game was they retold another Japanese game. Yeah, it was called Doki Doki Panic over in Japan. And the original character sprite was kind of like, uh, what was he, an Arabic guy or yeah, something? Yeah, kind of like an Arabic little guy. He became Mario. <laughs> and then they introduced the other characters in the Mushroom Kingdom, like Luigi, and they put in the princess and Toad. The game was exactly the same. You had the four characters to choose from who all played differently. They just retooled it for the Mario universe. But the bad guys, such as these shy guys we see here, were in Doki Doki Panic and then became Mario staple characters because of this being game. in this game. So they weren't originally intended to be Mario characters. Oh, look at that trickery. Yeah. So uh, this game in Japan is known as Super Mario USA. So there are technically in the chronology two Super Mario Brothers, one for Japan one for America and the other territories. And, uh... So it's kind of a divergent game. It plays a lot differently than the other Marios. Mario 3 played pretty similar to Mario 1 and Mario 2 Japan. This one's radically different, but they still... pull a, up mushrooms and... Still a great game. We talk about, uh... 
Shigeru Miyamoto's uh, visionary look at the world and stepping into other dimensions and parallel worlds and this uh, fits the mold yeah this definitely does and spoiler alert if you haven't played through the game it's a dream <laughs> it's all a dream uh, you find out at the end that Mario dreamed the whole thing that's why there's all these crazy characters that weren't in Mario 1 ha 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 that makes it make sense so uh, this was all a dream in Mario's brain you have the lottery after this which was always fun try and get the extra lives and there were warp zones in this game too yeah it so did it had a lot of the the Mario stuff but it just you know I don't know why they didn't make it a Mario game in to begin with but Well, they decided to go with it for the U.S. release, and this is what we have. And it's one of the, it's really an iconic game still. Now, the little, the original character looks most like Toad. In fact, he looks almost exactly like Toad, except the hat's different. It's more he of actually, a turban than a mushroom shell. Yeah, he has a turban, so they just kind of made it a mushroom head. So they kept the original character model. They just made him Toad. Yep. That's why Toad is a little more uh, stocky in this game than he is everywhere else. Yeah. This is, I think this is the tallest Toad Because they were lazy. <laughs> That's why, because they didn't feel like changing him. Now, I chose not to take the warp there because I wanted to fight uh, Mauser here. Here's where the warp would be. You just go down that, and I believe it takes you to level you four. You can only hear that tip on NewGenGamers.com. Yeah. Shh, don't tell anyone. I am giving out the tips left and right here tonight. Ray is a 1990s uh, Nintendo Power game counselor lost in time. That's right. Found in the year 2008 by New Gen Gamers. He tells us of retro... I am the of, retro Of man. the way things were back in his day. Man, that makes me feel old. <laughs> we are becoming codgers. And we don't even realize it. Those of us who uh, were weaned on this system uh, remember it fondly. Some of you may have uh, started playing video games later on. Maybe earlier on. But for Ray and I, this is probably this is the system that we really cut our teeth on. Yeah, we all grew up with this one, and that's why it's the nearest and dearest to our hearts, and we remember all these things like, you know, we, we're not reading off of a script here. We like it more than we like our families. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But I like my family. <laughs> I didn't say I dislike them. I'm just saying it's it's almost like a another brother or a buddy or, you know, someone you remember hanging out with. Yeah, these video game consoles become that level uh, with you, and it's a, an experience. It's a shared experience between friends and family. I will so, admit I, might, I like this game more than my elementary school class. I've seen you hug Mario cutouts, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will definitely have to say that it is a cultural thing. I mean, it is it is a part of our lives, and that's why we do this, you know... They're really great memories and great experiences and and great fun even to this day. Yeah, Mario is my friend more than any kid in my class. <laughs> I like him he a understood lot. understood me. I like him a lot more than most of the kids I went to school with, and I still hang out with him more, probably. <laughs> Hell, I don't even know where half the kids I knew are anymore. <laughs> Not that I care to know. But that's the effect that, uh, that this culture has... I think, and that these games have. They are certainly memorable experiences, and that's what the Nintendo uh, really brought to the table. All of the games we're looking at here are really memorable, you know, and we had to pick a limited selection of games, and we're just running our mouths for a couple hours here, so let's move on. And now, here... This is iconic right here. We looked at The Legend of Zelda, we looked at several Super Mario Brothers, and looked at the differences between them. Here's a very different Legend of Zelda title from 
um, pretty much any other one in the series. Yeah, this one kind of went off on its own and was more of like an adventure RPG title. Yeah, it added a lot more RPG titles, like a dedicated overworld map, um, more of a hit point system to build your character up. Um, so, we're going to hop into a game, start it off right here at the beginning. It's not right at the beginning, but pretty close. So here's the overworld map. But you can get into battles from the overworld map, and you get to different towns and dungeons through this overworld map. Now, wonderful tip number two, or number 27, if you stay on the path, you don't run into any battles. That is true. If you stay on the beaten path, you the wander into that. Here comes the monsters. And so whenever you get into a battle, you don't just go into a a battle like most RPGs where you just have a couple bad guys. You actually go into a little cutscene into whatever area you're in and you've got to basically survive through it. Whatever, you know, enemies happen to be there and whatever you happen to run into. So it's really different uh, and there's not many games you can compare it to. I can't think of anything to directly compare this game design to. No, it plays a little bit like a Final Fantasy, but not quite. You it know plays I mean? a little bit like a lot of things, but not quite. It's very, very odd. But you do get slimes, which are standard in RPGs. So they do have that. But you see, those guys are the Moblin Guards from the original Zelda. And so there's a lot of uh, characters from the first game. There's new characters. And uh, again, you have to go through the different dungeons and... Uh, collect weapon power-ups, but th all the battles are way different. <clears throat> you go into these different towns, so you actually have interactions with NPCs beyond old man and old woman who give you blanket responses. These people have a little bit of character. Not much more. <laughs> so there's some tips, and so you write all these tips down in your little notebook in the back of your manual and try and put it together to try and figure out the puzzles because there are a lot of tough puzzles in this game. Okay. It's very hard. Now, this is how Link gets health. The prostitute takes him inside. Well, you should be able to go inside. <laughs> I'll just go have to go lose some life first. It's kind of like the GTA system. <laughs> Except you don't murder her for your money back. Okay, now I'll go back to the town since I lost some health. Hello, prostitute. Yeah, that was a quickie. <laughs> Now, wow, you know, when I was eight years old, I did not realize what was happening there. That is Now, for something <laughs> a little more disturbing... Whoa! Hey! <laughs> get off her! I can give you magic! Oh! Come back anytime! No! Link, <laughs> no! She's old, man! Oh. Bet you never thought of it that way, did you? No. That was frightening. All right. <laughs> what is happening? This game's even weirder than I remember it. I am error. <laughs> Get out of this town. This is frightening. So, as you can see, a very different affair than the other Zelda. Now you can say that again. <clears throat> very odd. And very, very, very difficult. Yeah, this game is not easy. Like, take this cave, for instance. Like, take these invisible characters, for instance. These guys are in the dark, so you can't see them, so you've got to try and anticipate where they're going to be and try and get through, and you're, who better go see that prostitute again. Now, we'll segue that into actually something pertinent, because <laughs> <laughs> before Nintendo got in, into the video game industry, uh, they originally started as a playing card game company in the 1800s. When Hiroshi Yamauchi came into power and... Uh, the mid 1950 or the mid 1900s uh, they uh, tried different avenues of entertainment one of these avenues was love hotels oh yeah now a love hotels purpose is of course for lovers to romantically get away and 
and get their oink on. And uh, <laughs> and so Nintendo owned and operated these. So they may be a family-friendly company, but they definitely support the sex. Yes, they do. And, of course, those places are for romantic getaways, prostitutes, and mistresses. I mean, that's, you know, there's only three real things that those are for. So that's how we bring that back around to prostitutes and make it relevant and not just uh, rampant uh, filth. <laughs> now you can run into a fairy here. Fairies will randomly appear. Oh look, the bats are back. So in the top right you see uh, his experience level. As you kill things you get experience points and try and level up to the next level and when you do you can pick uh, where your power goes and so uh, you've got to try and build yourself up similar to other RPGs through and experience. the first point. part of the game such a pain to get through. Oh it's rough. I mean once you start getting the power ups and everything and you start getting the extra spells you know things start to light up a bit but getting through those first few levels is just so tough. The game has really good graphics uh, in those backgrounds as well. Get that slam. Oh, and there we go. There so we go. this was uh, before Nintendo just kind of franchised out every game series and they really tried to make sequels radically different. If you look at uh, Shigeru Miyamoto's uh, sequels such as uh, Super Mario Brothers 2 and USA, Zelda 2, um, Donkey Kong Jr., they're all radically different than their uh, than the original games. Yeah. And any more Nintendo's games really suffer from sequelitis and a lot of them don't change over several generations. Uh, you know, fans demand that to a point, and that's kind of necessary to retain the series, but during this time, they really experimented with their series. They wanted to see what was going to be the best thing that worked for them. Yeah, and it, it it's a really good way to go about things, because it ended up uh, bringing things like different characters and different mechanics to, to these series that would retain. Some of the characters and things in this game would be in later Zelda titles, Although, you know, the design itself would go back more uh, to how Zelda 1 was. You know, when we look at A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening, they definitely play more like the first first Zelda. Well, here's a dungeon. Maybe. <laughs> These enemies are nasty. Brutal. Yeah. Because you're not just fighting an enemy. It's not like your typical RPG where you just sit back and attack, magic spell... You know, every one of those battles you've got to be actively involved in. Yeah, it's these, all live. These dungeons are tiring, and that's, you know, as I said earlier with the Zelda game, they're, they're, they push your limits and of, uh, of trying to figure out what you have to do, the battles are tough, and you really do feel tired and rewarded when you get to the bottom of these dungeons. I just run away a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Ray takes the run away, stab at him, run away, stab at him approach, which does work. Hit him in the legs. There you go. Oh, these bastards. Oh, it was just about to get a lot worse because you got those hopping guys coming after you. Oh, I know. These enemies suck. This game is very hard. Well, <laughs> shall we move on to a different uh, hard I think, title? I think so because this is just going to get ugly, I think. Yeah. This is one you've got to invest yourself into. and Yeah, you have to really dig into this title. So but it's still enjoyable. If you've never checked it out and won a challenge and missed it, get Adventure it. Adventure of Link is for you. Contenders, take them down with your controller, beat them all, and you've got a shot at Tyson's title. Power! Power! But 
but uh, you've got to beat Mike Tyson. <laughs> Mike Tyson's Punch-Out from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. Get the power to move with the Acclaim wireless remote for your Nintendo entertainment system. The Acclaim remote gets you mobile in a WrestleMania grudge match. Flying Airwolf, the Acclaim remote's rapid-fire mode means higher scores permission. In the battle for Iron Sword, seconds count. So you need a controller with a look and feel you already know. Accurate up to 30 feet. The official wireless remote controller, licensed by Nintendo, created by Acclaim. Get the Acclaim remote, the power to move. ご飯よ。はい、メドアよ。ここに来たものはみんな石になるのじゃ。ピットよ、メデューサを倒せ。光の国エンジェランドに平和を呼び戻すのじゃ。マルチアクションゲーム、光神話パルテナの鏡。あ
And a good game design, though. We gotta watch beating each other up here. This is one danger with go. this game. Yeah. Ah. Stop picking things up. And I'm dead. Okay. Okay, get him. One cool thing with this game, too, is there's a lot of different uh, gameplay styles. You'll see the uh, one style here when we get to the end of this level. Take that. Who knew pigs could fly? <laughs> Only in England. Now, of course, this was... Uh, whoa! This was made by Rare and Trade West, who are British companies. Rare would later become a second party for Nintendo and uh, become prolific on the Nintendo 64. They would then be bought by Microsoft and absorbed into the Microsoft microcosm and essentially exist in name only now. <laughs> so this section here is really cool. I like this view. Oh, wow. So it's not just, you know, a beat-em-up the whole way through. There's different gameplay styles. There's a uh, little Land Rover level that's insanely hard where you have to get in a little boat or get in a little speeder thing and uh, jump across platforms at high speeds, and it's almost impossible to beat. Oh, you got him. Good job. Yeah. Next, we'll see another gameplay style. Oh, they mixed it up so much in this game. It was yeah. great. Wow. You have some cool little cutscenes here with some large breasts on a sinister-looking woman and a crazy chicken guy that's your friend. So it had a cool backstory here in the Wookiee hole. Hey. <laughs> Which one am I? Yellow. So here we uh, go down into this cavern. Woo. Try not to kill each other. Yeah, that is the biggest challenge. I'll stay high, you stay low. Okay, that'll that'll work for me. So you got to get a strategy when you're working as a team on this. Whoops. Whoa. I shouldn't have went down there. <laughs> yeah, you said one of those flies. Oh, yes. Yeah, I believe you told me to stay low. <laughs> yes. So we descend deeper and deeper into the cavern. Oh, these guys are rough. Ow. As they shock you. Okay, that whoop. Not done yet. I died. Very challenging game. Yeah, they, they made this game probably one of the harder games on the NES. I mean... That that racer scene is almost impossible to beat. I mean, your timing has to be impeccable. Which proves that not only Japanese companies can make games that are impossibly <laughs> hard. Absolutely. Bam! Nice. So it is really cool that they break up the levels and it's not just a straight beat-em-up, as a lot of the games like this were. Yeah, they you really know, thought outside the box with this. We'd see a lot of these types of games during the 16-bit era. And uh, Trade West um, also uh, did the Double Dragon series. So they had the Battletoads and Double Dragons game for the Genesis and Super Nintendo. Which I thought was awesome, by the way. Yeah, but that was the last time we'd see um, the, the Battle the Toads. And I'm not sure... We didn't see... The, Double Dragon too much after that either. No, the so, last Double Dragon game was uh, Double Dragon 5, I believe, and that was a, like a fighting game. Yeah, so tra Trade West, I'm not sure if they got bought out or what happened to them, but... Uh, uh, right now, uh, the Virtual Console just released Double Dragon, and Axis was credited as the publisher of it. Okay. So I'm but, assuming that they own the rights to um, Trade West stuff now. But it's too bad because we... Never got to see any more Battletoads or Double Dragons games, and they were both great designs. And uh, I just wonder how well those would have translated to 3D if attempted. I don't know. We'll never know. Oh, Rash is done. Oh, but he can continue. We have to start the whole thing again. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is why this game is very difficult, especially because we're going to have to do that again when I die. 
<laughs> okay. So shall we continue on? Yeah, especially since you just killed me. <laughs> so right. this is Battle Toads, a look at another uh, beat 'em up game. This one from Trade West. So if you're into old school beat 'em ups, this is one of the better ones. Boot first time. All right, everybody. Here we're taking a look at Metroid for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And as we said, this was developed by Gunpei Yokoi, so let's go back into the Gunpei Yokoi story. He left Nintendo in 96 after the failed Virtual Boy. Yeah, that was a sad time for um, everyone at Nintendo. The worst disgrace of Gunpei Yokoi's life... Uh, it was a system that just failed in every way, and it's too bad. It was an ahead-of-its-time concept, I think, and maybe someday we can sit down and take a look um, at the Virtual Boy ourselves. We don't have one currently, so uh, maybe us or one of our affiliates can give you a look at that. But it's a system that really never caught on. Yeah, It well, I think the fact that it um, created migraines was... <laughs> um, a problem. That's definitely bad for consumer confidence and bad for sustainable playability. They recommended, you know, no more than an hour of playtime at a time. And so it failed. So Gunpei Yokoi, the inventor of the Game Boy, the inventor of many great game designs, was shamed due to the failure of the Virtual Boy because it was his baby. And al along with that, at that time, the uh, Game Boy Color was also around and it never took off as well as the original Game Boy hardware or the Game Boy Advance hardware would. It kind of fell to the wayside as well. Uh, See, now even to that point, I thought that the Game Boy Color was just an upgrade, as most people I think did. Yeah, the Game Boy Color was a... Uh, Maybe there's a bit of confusion with the consumer. Yeah, I think there was because it was a completely different product than the Game Boy, different hardware. It was backwards compatible but it had a lot more power and was able to do NES ports. The only problem they had with that was it had a different screen resolution. So when they ported the Nintendo games, Nintendo Entertainment System games onto it, they ended up uh, with uh, parts of the screen that couldn't appear or they had to squash the image, which is what they did with Crystallis. Uh, Super Mario Brothers Deluxe, they had to extend the screen. Neither way worked and so they couldn't even do the NES ports, which would have really, I think, saved the system and made it stand out. Oh, yeah, because the NES ports that they made for the Game Boy Advance sold so well. Yeah, so they really missed their mark with the Game Boy Pocket, which, or I mean with the Game Boy Color, which was another Gunpei Yokoi uh, baby. So he had these two huge failures. The first failures that Nintendo had experienced in, you know, over a decade... And so the company shamed him. They literally put him in an office in the center of the building with no windows so that he could not look out the window. That's how how mad Hiroshi Yamauchi was about all of these failures. And so Yokoi left the company in 96, kind of at their discretion, kind of at his own discretion, kind of a he needed to get out of there because they didn't want him and he didn't want to be there which is a total shame. So he went out on his own and designed the Wonder Swan, which was a great handheld game design, and uh, you could play two different ways. You could hold it vertically, and you could also hold it horizontally. It had well, a nice picture. Familiar. It <laughs> sounds very familiar. And uh, so Nintendo looked at the design and uh, I think eventually ended up with their game and or with their DS design as a combination of the original Game & Watch designs of Yokoi with the ability to turn it sideways like the Wonder Swan. So Nintendo's, one of their most successful pieces of hardware to date, the DS, was almost wholly inspired by Yokoi, but Yokoi was dead by the time it came out and by the time Nintendo did it. Yeah, it's kind of sad. <laughs> so go, uh, Gunpei Yokoi died in 1997 in a car wreck and um, 
the Wonder Swan never took off, the Game Boy Advance did take off, and the DS subsequently followed it and massively has taken off. So, uh, I'm just blindly exploring here. Yeah. <laughs> so th this is Metroid. Uh, the basics of the game is just explore through, find your, you know, you want to save the planet Zebes from um, the Mother Brain who is unleashing Metroids onto the Earth, which are basically like life-sucking beings. Bad. Very bad. Bad life-sucking beings. And, you know, the basics of the gameplay is, you know, just point and shoot and... Um, survive. Collect, survive. There's a definite overtone of, uh, you are alone in this world, you're the only person, and you've got to survive against these monsters. And it's very dark and ambient. And uh, we looked at Kid Icarus earlier, which was an, another design by, by Gunpei Yokoi. Well, one second there, you were blocked there. You don't have the power up to get through there yet, which is one of the main uh, gameplay aesthetics of the Metroid series. Yeah, you need to find the power ups in the levels. So it's, it's kind of part exploratory, like Legend of Zelda, yet part platformer. Yeah, there's no overworld, there's no levels. It's all one big world. You know, you're in this underground cavern, and you just travel around it, and so you've got to come back to certain areas after you've uh, gotten the correct power-up. So once he can blow up that little wall back there, he could come back through and go farther. So there's a lot of backtracking, and again, that gives you that sense of doom because you've got to experience all these difficult areas again. And uh, so, this was done by Yokoi, and he also did Kid Icarus, and you'll notice a lot of similarities in the design. They're very vertical, uh, as opposed to the a lot of the side-scrolling platform games we've seen. And if you look at, at the total size of this world as one existent world, because you just travel along through it. It's, oh, it's a massive world. It's one big map, and uh, it's a big world. Definitely on the scale of of anything that was available at this time this was probably one of the biggest maps out there yeah I mean Nintendo really pushed the bar because what what you were seeing in the Atari days and then what you saw with Nintendo games was such a huge leap that people when they first fired on the system was like what the hell is this yeah because <laughs> uh, very few of the Atari games had any depth you would play for 10 15 minutes and you've experienced pretty much everything the game's going to do. That first 10 to 15 minutes of owning the game, you've done it. You can just get better at it, perhaps, but you've done it. With these games, they kept going. There was the battery backup saves. There was the password systems that let you play a 20, 40, 60, 80, 100-hour game one time through. Huge experiences, huge games that were not possible on the earlier systems at and all. The best thing about the NES is that while they retained that depth and pushed things to a new boundary, they also kept it simple. Easy to play, easy to navigate. Uh, you know, most of these games you can pick up and within a couple minutes figure out what you're doing, even if there's, you know, all that depth to it. Yeah, it's... It's like it has the simplicity and the depth all at the same time, and that was the magic of Nintendo titles. Like, the original Nintendo titles. Was the fact that you could both have simplicity and depth all in one big package. So these games were radically different than what was available on the arcade scene and on the Crap. early home <laughs> scene. And so it really was a new foundation and revolution pushed by Nintendo and by all these other companies that would come along uh, such as Square Enix which we'll talk about here in a little bit yeah I think we've gotten quite a good look at the world of Metroid here you, as you see there's so many different types of areas that I've just explored in these five ten minutes we've been here yeah the games loosely based on the film alien which uh, also has the <clears throat> the claustrophobic sense of impending doom that that you experience in this and of course the major spoiler which we will not give away just in case anyone's not finished <laughs> or that anyone that might actually play through this and for the Nintendo fanboys to go yeah I know what you're talking about 
Yeah. <laughs> because All right, everybody. If you're a new true Nintendo fan, you'll know what we're talking about. If you're not, then you need to do your homework or watch Console Wars of the Past Super Nintendo. And we also give it away there. Yeah, we do give it away in Super Nintendo. So, so for the attentive fan, you will or know. Or for the compulsive fan, you'll know. For the rest, let's move on. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. Dr. Mario. Dr. Mario. Now, this wasn't the first puzzle game that we Set would see five. on the Nintendo, but this was kind of the follow-up to Tetris. You going on high speed? <laughs> no. Okay. I'm going to go with chill, though. So, we really can't mention this game without mentioning Tetris, but we're playing this one first. So, the goal here is to match the colored pills How's that? <laughs> with uh, the creature that uh, is on your screen. So you match up the blocks. Ooh, I messed up. And, uh, and try and clear the board. Now here we're doing the two-player battle. Which is a challenge in its own right. Oh, man, I am screwing this up. And this is another one that um, Ray and I, and I'm sure many others, have spent many, many hours playing. Crap. It's a great challenge, and uh, Nintendo has been uh, prolific with their puzzle games over the years. They've had so many great puzzle game series, and for fans of puzzle games, such as myself, um, they've always had the best stuff. But I'm really not focused here, so I think Ray may win this. I'm the Dr. Mario Master. <laughs> so, that was not a good round. I'll go for another one. Yep. Yeah, Dr. Mario was a fun little puzzle game, and I wanted to throw this one in here just as kind of like a... Just to show you the kind of depth that Nintendo had in their puzzle games. Yeah, and this was another type of game that we didn't see a whole lot of on the Atari. There were some, you know, puzzle and parlor games, but the puzzle game genre that we kind of know now started with uh, Tetris. Was born with Tetris. Te born with Tetris, and its son was Dr. Mario. So there were so many good puzzle titles coming out at that time. It, it just created a whole genre. Yeah, uh, you know, everyone would follow over the years with their own takes on block matching and building games. Crap! Crap. <laughs> but we really saw it start on this system. And with Nintendo. Nintendo pushed for these types of games because they were different, they were innovative, and they were fun. And that was the whole meat of, of what they were uh, trying to create. What the fuck am I doing? <laughs> oh, I don't know what the F I did there. Or there, jeez. <laughs> we're having a lot of what the F moments here. Yeah, we're sucking it up here. At least I am. Not not, not my best playing of Dr. Mario. I'm not doing too hot myself. <laughs> the doctor is not in. Oh, I can salvage this. Oh, I think I might have just boned myself pretty hard. Oh, yeah, I just... Oh, this is going to be a... Pff, not good. This is going to be tough to pull back. Uh, I might be able to salvage this. <laughs> so we're, we're... We're definitely competing here, if you yeah, can't tell. Yeah, we're losing our focus on our commentary here, so... Uh, this is Dr. Mario. Yes. And I imagine anyone watching it's probably kind of got their mind lost on the little pills, too. It's such yeah. a great design and really fun. Brightly colored. Oh, son of a... <laughs> Very difficult. And so, uh, again, Nintendo has stuck... Ah, 
Nintendo <laughs> has stuck with the puzzle game day with stuff like Brain Age. And so let's look at something in the puzzle genre, ties in age and ties in with uh, Nintendo lore. Tie together. <laughs> We're just like, ooh, Dr. Mario. Yeah, <laughs> trouble focusing on the commentary, trying to play it. Uh, getting completely lost in the game happens every now and then. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, welcome back. And now we're going to take a look at Adventure of Lolo. This was made by Hal. Hal was started uh, by a um, guy that owned a computer store, and he had a bunch of young kids that were interested in computers as well that would hang out at uh, his store a lot. And so they got together and decided to start the company Hal. <coughs> and started making video games. And one of the early founding members <clears throat> was a fellow named Satora Iwata. He that was, name sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, he was one of the young kids that was hanging out and uh, became part of this little group. Traditional video game realm. And uh, it's really working well for the company, and that's kind of their current direction. And uh, to find out more about all that, uh, visit our website and listen to some of our podcasts. We go into a lot of depth with, with that stuff. And what Nintendo has planned for, you know, their whole strategy. Yeah, so this was um, an early game for HAL that really put them on the map and maybe got them recognized in Nintendo's eyes. Good trap. Yeah, so if you do these levels uh, the right way, you can stay out of trouble. If I wouldn't have blocked those guys in, they could have came freely at me and tried to kill me. So these... Oh, lordy. These games uh, <laughs> are very, very difficult and will go on for dozens and dozens of levels, and they're tough to get through. But they're fun, that's the thing. It's It's got that addictive quality to yeah, it. Yeah, it's got that addictive, I want to play back through it and figure out how to do that the right way quality that, that makes Nintendo games great and, you know, probably one of the reasons that they latched on to HAL. And HAL would later create one of the greatest games, arguably of all time, Super Smash Bros. Melee. I mean, that game ranks up there with some of the the best ever. So, um, let's do one more floor here and we'll move on. Yep. Oh, okay. There's Lord. Adventures of Lolo. A very fun, a very quirky title. I'd say check it out. Welcome to 1905. New York. New York. And welcome back to Console Wars of the Past. We're here. doing the NES era here, taking a look at Little Nemo the Dream Master. Now here is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, it's a really uh, light-hearted, fun platform game from Capcom. And it's really fun. That one. And has a kind of a cool backstory. You're Little Nemo, you enter into the into Dream World here. And so everything's just crazy and wacky. There's, you know, an upside down topsy turvy level. There's all these crazy Jiminy Cricket characters. Uh, it has a lot of, you know, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Wizard of Oz type feel to it. Feel to it. It's, you know, very bizarre, very, um, you don't know what's what. Uh, and so it's a really cool backstory that goes with it, I think. And they actually made a movie of this game, which I don't think a lot of people are aware of, because this not a lot of people are aware of this series. They never whoop, they never did any sequels to it, so uh, a lot of people have missed it. Now you get these... Ah. Wait, they made a movie? Yeah. Now you get these animal friends here. We'll go into that. Uh, you get these animal power-ups, and then you can get different abilities, such as jumping higher, swimming, and some other things that will help you through the game. So, yes, they made a movie of Little Nemo based on the game, and uh, it wasn't that bad. And uh, it was, you know, based in the, the dream world and everything, and I can't remember exactly how it all went because I was What was the young. title? Little Nemo. Little Nemo. Mm-hmm. 
Huh. IMDB it. It's out there. No kidding. So there's your obscure fact. You got fact. me on that one. Yeah, here's your obscure <laughs> fact for the video. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so uh, it wasn't that bad. No, it's a kid's movie, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's a kid's movie, but uh, it was interesting. I and love it, the it, little animal power-ups. And you power know, ups. for being a video game-based movie, it followed the, the game pretty closely, and I don't think Little Nemo exists in any other media. I think it's a, based exclusively on this game. So, it's really interesting. Huh. So here you see you got to switch animals at times. Oh, you prick. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, to get through the levels and get back on my froggy here. With that mole, I could dig underground. Yeah, this is... I never actually got to play this when I was younger. Oh, this is sweet. If you like Mega Man or any other Capcom platformer, you will love Little Nemo. It's one that a lot of people missed. It's kind of obscure. But if you're into to platformers, you got to check out Little Nemo. Oh, you know I'm hardcore on platformers. Oh, snap. I didn't get enough keys. Oh, I forgot. If you're not... If you don't feed the animals candy first, they will hurt you. So I gotta go find the other two keys in the level in order to finish it. This one doesn't seem as difficult as some of the other Capcom games, I will admit. It's definitely made for kids, so it's a little bit easier, but definitely not easy I mean it's it's a challenging game it makes you think yeah the level design's pretty tough because you got to find all these keys oh. and there's secrets like traveling down along here yeah. oh nice to get my little lizard friend and a one-up Now where is the other key? Is it up there? It could be. Oop. Look it's out! A bottle oh, of some sort. Call him. Oh man. You can't hurt them guys. Nah. Well, different enemies have different powers. <clears throat> the salamander can't jump on guys. Only that frog can. Oh. So if you don't have the right suit, you can't do certain things. So. And of course, again, the enemies hurt you. Or, I mean, your animal friends hurt you if you don't have the power-ups. I'm thinking the key's back here somewhere. Get away. Well, if we don't find it in this video, one of our friends at YouTube will let us know. They're pretty good about that. Well, I know, I know it's in here. I've played this game many times, but it's just been many years. Yeah. That's our problem with some of, a lot of these games is... We've played them. It's just, it's been a decade and a half since we have. Yeah. And, you know, we just are going through this kind of as a trip down memory lane while throwing in all the information, you know? Yeah, so sometimes uh, it's if tough our... to remember where every friggin' secret is for every game. And, you know, we don't, we don't jump and find guides to, you know do the everything perfectly we you know we're, we're kind of doing this just like we remember it yeah we're playing it for fun just hopping into these games as you would back then perhaps over here I'm not sure so I'm gonna hop back to the end of the stage if I don't find the key we'll move on hmm I haven't seen it. Oh, they're tricky. I probably have to have one of the specific animals there. There it is. See? Tricky. <laughs> you had to have the frog, and you had to jump up there to get it. Or you could have the salamander and climb that wall. So well, now we have enough it. keys. So let's go ahead and hop into the second level real quick, I guess. All right. Take a quick look at what the second level has to offer. Because they're all varied and they're all a lot of fun. There's some underwater levels and um, they're all very bizarre and get more bizarre as you go, actually. 
and you get your little cutscenes here. Kind of a cool backstory and kind of like a almost dark feeling. It's like a continuing dream is what it yeah, seems it, like. It is. It's really well paced and you meet all these fun little characters. I This is a really underrated game. Alright, Capcom or you happen to be listening, this is one you want to put on the Virtual Console. Yeah, I don't know why they quit with this series. Well, maybe it just, you know, one of those, you know, Capcom has a lot of good series that sometimes they just let go because times... They have too many. <laughs> yeah. There were just too many. Now this dude can punch stuff. Like, I lament like crazy for another beautiful Joe. Yeah. Like an actual beautiful Joe, but I don't I don't know if it's going to happen this generation or not. They're finally bringing back Bionic Commando. So, there is a, another lost gem of Capcom's. Check it out. If you want to own it, you're going to have to buy it from shop.newgengamers.com. The best place to buy retro video games, in my opinion. Yeah? <laughs> Ray's <laughs> not going to dispute that, so... We have a lot of retro stuff. <laughs> We've got games. Check them out. And let's check out another game. Here is another game that a lot of people missed that was great. Uh, and this one's from Nintendo. Star Tropics. And uh, we have a game at the very end, but I'll save that video footage for a Ray's Retro review because we're not going to take quite as long of a look at this game. So we're going to hop into into a little bit different level here. This is still fairly late into the game. This is going into the spaceship. Now this game starts off with the story of a young boy named Mikey who has to figure out the mystery of what happened to his uncle. His uncle is gone missing and he's an archaeologist who studies long-lost mysteries. So, uh, he's stumbled upon some great mystery and gone missing, and you as his nephew have been chosen by the village people of, uh, I believe it's Cola <laughs> Village, to save the world. You've been called by the village people? I just um, wanted to run with that. Yeah, he, and he actually looks like one of the village people. He looks like the Indian. Oh, so, really? <laughs> he's like an islander guy. Oh. This is a tough level, holy crap. It um, runs on the heart system, I let's, see. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and go into a little bit easier area here so I can actually show you the game. We'll go to Goober. Wow, this is this game was originally played by my friend Goober, apparently when I was much younger. These are old, old games. This is my original <clears throat> copy of this game. Oh, get up. So this is after an important event here. There's a... a a fairly deep story for a game of this time. So, this is almost um, an exact gameplay uh, take of The Legend of Zelda. Yeah, it looks and feels like a lot like Zelda, but it has the Final Fantasy-like storyline. Yeah, we have an overworld map here, like a lot of RPGs, but it has a, a heart system of, of your life like Zelda does. Um, you get a few different weapons, not as many as you'd get in Zelda, but there's a lot of puzzles. Uh, there's some really tough puzzles that are almost impossible to figure out on your own. Uh, Nintendo Power <laughs> sold a lot of issues uh, with their guides for this game, and they had an official Nintendo strategy guide for it, which this was one of the first games to get an official Nintendo strategy guide because it was so hard after some of their earlier... Um, Ones, uh, it was one of their first ones that they released for a specific game. Like Final Fantasy and this. Yeah. Now, as you can see here, I got the bolo. Now I went the wrong way. But they trick you because you can only jump one square at a time. So a lot of the, the rooms, you have to figure out how to get through them by figuring out where to jump. And it's just very deceptive. The enemies here can cross the water, but I can't. So they have kind of... A, an advantage in attacking so it's tough to hit guys sometimes and the the dungeons are very treacherous as I said really really hard puzzles uh, the piano puzzle and I think like the fifth dungeon is 
I'm loving the graphics on this game. Any person who can just get that piano is a natural. Is either a nat it, It's not a common logic problem though. It's very tough. I mean, you you just have to keep trying stuff. It's so hard. So this game challenges you the whole way through. Great, great game. Very underrated. Missed by a <laughs> lot of. Uh, I like the stance puzzle there. Any Anyone who's a fan of action RPGs, adventure games, Zelda would love this game. I know there's something else here. I think there is. Nope. So you gotta jump on every little block to, to make sure in every room. So a lot of the... Oh, oh here we go. Oh, yeah, <laughs> this is where the game gets tough. Oh, God. Yeah. And you died. And you die. A lot. Oh. So this is more than just kill the enemy, solve the puzzle. You've also got a lot of timing in those puzzles. Oh, my so goodness. So there's a lot to this game. Oh, it very is. Very deep. It's very deep and very hard. There's a lot of dungeons. You saw uh, when I started off there, I was on that spaceship. As you get deeper into the story and figure out the, the mystery of your uncle, you encounter space aliens and robots and... All that fun stuff. Which once again proves that when Nintendo makes an RPG, they really put their heart and soul into it. Yeah, I don't know which team did this game, but kudos to whoever did it. This is one of their really great designs that we never saw a sequel of. We're looking at a lot of these uh, one-hit wonder games that never saw sequels. Well, a lot of good Nintendo RPGs never get sequels, like yeah. Earthbound. Yeah. There are at least not ones that we see here in cool. America. Okay, so that's me getting a stomping in Star Tropics. However, Check it out. Yeah, it's an awesome game. Is this on the virtual console? Yes, it is. So, I actually gifted it to Luke. Well, <laughs> then I'm sure Luke enjoyed it. And anyone else uh, who likes Nintendo games and really great games is probably going to like this because there's a lot to like. And uh, it's also one of the few games where you get to have a dolphin friend, oh. and uh, which I think is very impressive. And there's also... Uh, a lot of subtle humor and uh, some in-jokes. Um, there's a, just too much to like. Check it out. This is one... Very that, earthboundish. <laughs> one that Ron very very highly recommends. It gets my, uh, my two thumbs up. All right. We're going to move on now. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Console Wars of the Past. And We're if you doing the NES era. And if you haven't left, then then you're still with us. Yes. Thank you for sticking <laughs> with us through this through this this epic. arduous arduous epic journey through the Nintendo Entertainment System lore, history, and I think arduous is a strong word. It's been arduous. We've had a lot of challenges. The challenge has been there. We have met it. It's always there. And now uh, we talk about the challenge always being there. That reminds me of a company called Sega. Yes, Nintendo's competition at this time. I think Sega had a video game system out at this time, but me and the rest of the world did not know about it. No, most people didn't. It was the, the one we covered before this. Now, it was a very good system and a very underrated system, but unfortunately... Um, about five people knew about it. Yes, we're speaking of the Sega Master System. Some people may have never even heard of it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Well, remember, our Sega Master System is before this. Well, any attentive viewer would already know all about the Sega Master System. That but for th but for those of you Nintendo fans who have just hopped onto this to check out the NES and want to see more of uh, some lesser-known systems... Get away, get away, get away. The Master System was a head-to-head competitor with the Nintendo, but they only ended up selling about 9 million units. Nintendo sold about 62 million. We see who won that battle. That's a slight landslide. And to return <laughs> to another story that we kind of left off on earlier, because we jump around here with that, uh, because there's so much information with this system. And we don't want to sound dry and boring. And yeah, so we're trying to hit as much as possible. Uh, we talked about Atari having the Atari 7800 ready in 1984, but not releasing it. They sat on it because they thought the video game industry was dead. They didn't think there was a sustainable market. So they had a product and they said, screw it, 
we're just not even going to waste our time with it. We've lost too much money. Let's just be a computer company. So Nintendo releases the bomb of the Famicom in Japan, and it takes off. 85, they release it in America, and instantly it takes off. Next thing you know, everyone's playing Super Mario Brothers. Everyone's buying a Nintendo. Atari stands there holding their dicks and says... What happened? Why <laughs> did we not do this? Wait a second. We have one of those. People want these things again. We have a video game system. Let's release it. Ooh. But they released it way too late with way too little. It's still, even coming out several years later, didn't have hardly any games for it at its launch. Basically, all they had were the games that were developed for the original launch, and it failed miserably. So when we get to that system... We'll talk about its failures. The Master System, check out that video to see the failures that went on there. And for even more on this, uh, visit NewGenGamers.com and uh, read the articles that Ray's put together on the console wars uh, for some even more insight and some things that we didn't get to talk about in the videos. Yeah, I compiled a lot of in-depth information on you know, the, the actual history of the companies in this one. So, you can look more into their histories, you know, if you haven't heard it here. Or visit your local Wikipedia. Yes, that's an also a good way to look at it. But I'd prefer they read my articles. <laughs> yes, uh, I'd prefer they watch all of our content because we're trying to lay this out uh, as, a, as an experience of enjoying these consoles. Um, you know, not just as a documentary, but also to feel the magic and culture behind these 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 pieces of machinery and how they have really affected the world since they've come out. Nintendo has sold over one billion video game cartridges. That is phenomenal. So um, here we're looking at a game by Midway. This was a huge success in the arcades, a very different type of game, but really fun. Your goal is to get these papers inside of the mailboxes, which Ray is having some difficulty with. <laughs> That's because there's um, evil tires. There are evil tires in this game. There are a lot of evil neighbors in this game. So it's really lighthearted. You're the paper boy just trying to trying to earn a couple bucks by making it through town, throwing papers. Uh, this is the most treacherous town known to man. Yeah, so you've got to try and get through the obstacles and get all your papers delivered to all the houses that have subscribers. I think I'm just going to give one to everybody today. Because I'm not sure which house is... The ones with the mailboxes, isn't it? Oh, really? Hey, they got theirs. You yeah, if they have a mailbox, they're a subscriber. Stupid cat. And the game doesn't change a whole lot. You know, the houses come up in different orders. The, uh, the people and objects are always in different places, but... Whoa. Essentially, the game's the same. You get to the end, and then you get to go through the awesome training course. Let's see if he can do it this time, folks. Oh, I don't know how you made it through that, but... So before there were uh, extreme games... There was extreme paper boys. <laughs> yeah, that was about the most you got for uh, BMX biking. Well, let's take... Or not BMX. Yeah, BMX. Let's take a look at a... A title from one of Konami's subsidiaries that would become famous later on. All right. There we go. All right, everybody. This was from Konami's Ultra Games label. This is... You may recognize this. Maybe not. There's you may recognize the name Snake. Does Snake sound familiar? Metal Gear? Metal Gear? What's a Metal Gear? I don't know, but it's bringing like back memories. Mac. Where have Giant I seen this before? Snake. Lieutenant Snake. Snake. Oh! I know who they mean. Mm -hmm. Was this the, uh... Is this Solid Snake? Perhaps it is. 
So forgive our sarcasm, folks, as we introduce the Metal Gear before it was solid. Yes, this is the unofficial sequel to um, Metal Gear. This is uh, Snake's Revenge. And there is our hero, Snake. He looks a little bit different than the Metal Gear Solid Snake, but that's the same dude. And he is badass, as we know. So, uh, this game is uh, a sequel to Metal Gear. And Metal Gear was a different type of game. Rather than just run through and kill all the enemies, young video game designer Hideo Kojima had an idea. <clears throat> Maybe rather than just focus on killing the enemies, you could focus on stealth and getting away from the enemies and avoiding the enemies and make that the gameplay aesthetic. Uh-oh, someone's been seen. So once you're seen, all hell breaks loose and you've got to try and survive. Oh, check that out. So here's your little codec to let you communicate with others. So Hideo uh, Kojima... That, Hideo, <laughs> that is beastly. Hideo Kojima came to video game design uh, wanting to be a movie and anime director. And so he brought a different uh, type of feel to his games and as I said, didn't want to create a game where you just killed things. He wanted to create a game where you had to think and maybe work your way around the level and the other guys at Konami balked at the idea and laughed at him and said that would never work that was silly until he made a working demo of the original Metal Gear and then they played it and then they realized that this guy had a great idea and so the original Metal Gear was born and uh, and so it, it was a fairly well-known game and did fairly well, and Konami did more of them on the Nintendo Entertainment System with this one on the MSX computer system in Crap. Japan. And uh, the series would really gain fame on the PlayStation with Metal Gear Solid, which took the cinematic level to a whole new level and offered and ushered in a whole new type of game uh, when they took this to the 3D world. But this was the seeds for it, and if you've played Solid, you can see a lot of similarities to it, but at the same time, it's it's vastly different. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of has the same feel where you're sneaking around, but, you know, it's not, it's not the same, you know, until you have a bit more, uh, we're getting a little bit of a technical glitch here. <laughs> Our game is starting to crap out on us as we play through the level here, so we'll play till it goes into mush. <laughs> so, this could be pretty quick here. Just pretend that Snake's going into a some sort of hallucination and flashing back to a previous time in his cloned life. Anyone that's followed the Metal Gear series knows that the stories are very convoluted and have a lot of depth and backstory and are very odd so all right well that uh, was our look at metal gear um well snake's revenge yes so we wanted to throw that one out as a game made for the home consoles and one that helped put hideo kojima a now famed game designer on the map oh. wow. first you draw a circle then you then dot the eyes. Add a great big smile. And presto. It's Kirby! Whoa! I love Kirby's Adventure, which is another brilliant game design from HAL Laboratory. I'll start in level 5 here. And uh, we spoke of HAL earlier in our video segment when we played Adventures of Lolo. And you see a lot of Lolo in HAL. I think they liked going with the puffball character design. Now, Kirby is a really great platform game where you get a lot of different power-ups that uh, you'll need to get through the various levels, much like many platform games of the time, but it's got that Nintendo touch of, of gameplay perfection that it's just pure fun. Yeah, they really nailed it in this one. Kirby's, of course, now become prolific across Nintendo systems. He's been on 
the NES, Game Boy, Super Nintendo, N64. Uh, did he have a GameCube iteration? Uh, Kirby's Air Ride. There you go. Not quite a uh, traditional Kirby game, but they've kept the Kirby universe and characters alive. And, uh, of course, Kirby may be best known at this point for his role in Super Smash Brothers. Who is the most awesome character on the game, by the way. Which... Kirby's I, my personal favorite. I wonder why, how did that? <laughs> you know what I'd like to see is them uh, bring Lolo back as a playable character. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be. He could use... He has a lot of the same power-ups as Kirby. He, he sucks in eggs and spits them out. They could actually easily turn that character model into Lolo. So Nintendo... If you're listening, <laughs> give us Lolo we're, for Smash Bros. We're not going to hold our breath that anyone from Japan's listening to this, but you never know. Ah, oh, crap. Or from Nintendo, especially for that matter. But hey, fans get talking about it. Write Nintendo and demand Lolo. Actually, yeah, he's Lolo. His girl's La La. So... Demand, or they could also make them uh, alternates to uh, the Ice Climbers. Have oh, Lolo yeah, and Lala. Cool. There you go. The opportunity's there. Oh, the possibility for extra characters in that game is just astounding. It's yeah. Cool. Oh. So that's what Hal would go on to do after the successes that they established with this. This is the one that really... I love these mini games. This is the one that made them uh, really stand out world not world well worldwide but I mean um, this is the one people know Adventures of Lolo is pretty obscure this one most people that have played uh, the Nintendo know of now uh, quick quiz um, can you name which was the first game that Kirby appeared in uh, the Game Boy version yes true yes yes uh, Kirby was and well that's actually really worth noting because Kirby was almost created and pushed as a character for the uh, the Game Boy when it was just starting out and they didn't have a whole lot of great original properties. Kirby was one of their uh, early big ideas and big hits, and it did so well on the handheld that they said, well, let's make a home version. So that's where this one spawned from. So And this was just a huge expansion of Kirby's Dream World. So I, I got the trivia question. Viewers at home, did you know? I knew. <laughs> oh. Hey, I get into this quick shot one. <laughs> and this is what made this great game great. You know, it broke up the monotony of the of the platform levels give you a little bonus. There you go. You got a couple extra lives. Woohoo! I got King Deek to Deek. <laughs> and here you also get a little bit of uh, variety in choosing which levels you do. Now this is the crane This game. is fun. There. And you know, there's a, a really great um, at this point almost forgotten Kirby game for the Game Boy, which I'll now quiz you on, which well, I don't know how to phrase it, so I'll just say it. The 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 pinball one. Oh, the um, tilt and tumble. Yeah, no, not tilt and tumble. Uh, there's another one. It was an old Game Boy game. Wasn't tilt and tumble a Game Boy game? Um, or was it color? I believe it was Game Boy Color. Okay. But this one was I can't I can't think of the name of it, but uh, it was uh, a, a Kirby pinball game and set the standard for uh, the character pinball games that we'd see later, like Sonic's Pinball, Pokemon Pinball, Mario Pinball, any of the character themed pinballs. Um, I think were probably based off of that original one. Oh, I'll have to look into that one. Definitely, I'll uh, show it to you later. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't know there was a, a Kirby pinball. Like. It, yeah, so for you Nintendo and Kirby nuts out there, you got to play that because it's really fun. Just like all the Kirby games are really fun. There was also a Kirby game uh, for the um, 
the Japanese Satella View um, internet service, which never came to America, with some different mini games. There was like a baseball one and some different things. And again, it was only available. Or no, actually, I believe it was. It eventually did come out in America as. Um, what was the one with the different mini games? Um, the Kirby one. Yeah. Um, There's been a lot of Kirby games, and they and they really have extended the character to a lot of different types of games. Oh, um, I can't think of it right now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh. It's for the Super Nintendo. I was gonna say uh, something different though. Sarah just recently got me um, a Kirby cartoon series DVD. And Kirby also broke into the world of animated film. <laughs> He's that prolific, folks. It actually was a pretty funny little series. <laughs> I've never I've never seen the cartoon. It's called Kirby Right Back at Ya. I'm probably not gonna check it out, but <laughs> that's interesting to know. So. Uh, Kirby has become a, a a key character for Nintendo. They've thrown him in so many game designs. Crap. And this, and the Game Boy one's really where it started. Yeah. So check out Kirby's Adventure and any of the other Kirby games. They have a lot of good ones. Yeah, I really don't know that there's a bad Kirby game, actually, so... No, Kirby games are always really solid. H anything from HAL is solid. I haven't seen a bad HAL game yet, I don't think. No, I don't think least... they exist. <laughs> so. Alright, we're gonna move on to something a little more hardcore. What? Pink Puff Balls aren't hardcore? Well, that depends on your definition of hardcore. Nintendo. Defend the planet Zephus against the evil mother brain. It's survival or destruction. Do battle or die. Metroid only from Nintendo. Play Rad Racer. Play with power. It's turbo speed in 3D. It's treacherous tracks, hot cars, hairpin turns. One mistake and you'll roll. Rad Racer only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. Capcom introduces Little Nemo, the Dream Master. We tapped into your deepest, darkest nightmares. Hold on, Eddie, I think we got something. This could be it. I'm getting snakes, wasps. Wow, look at this stuff! Big lip tadpoles. This kid's turned himself into a killer bee. These kids are strange. Who dreamed up something so weird? You did. This one's riding a purple lizard. Holy smoke! Little Nemo, the Dream Master, for Nintendo by Capcom. You want to make a game out of this? Have you heard about the toughest Nintendo game of all? It's called The Search for Nintendo. You explore one store, and then another. But smart players go to Hills for Nintendo. And while no store has all the titles all the time, Hills has one of the biggest selections of Nintendo games anywhere, including the new Game Boy. It's the best way to win The Search for Nintendo. Hills, we're the store for great family values. Nintendo Entertainment System. 
I'm the creator of ultra games for Nintendo, like Metal Gear, where you're a commando searching for deadly weapons. Defender of the crown, with strategic castle sieges, waves and distress, and skate or die. In five rad events that pitch you against a friend or bionic Lester, so check out ultra games. Remember, I'm never farther than your TV. Uh, one more addendum with Kirby's Adventure is it had a really great marketing campaign for it where uh, they would uh, sit down people in a police station and uh, they would describe this terror that they saw that would suck everything up and all this and uh, so the character artist is drawing what they were talking about and it ended up being Kirby. Yeah. So see if you can find that commercial for that one, Ray. Okay. We've put Ray to the task. Now this so. is... Uh an interesting point here is we have the, one of the first video game cutscenes. Dun dun, this is intense. So here we see another game designer who brings a little bit of flash and flair to the scene, Mr. Tomonobu Itagaki. And this was his first big project. He was involved with Tech Mobile, but this was his first as lead designer. And he would go on to have a prolific career with the Dead or Alive series and with this series and would become head of uh, Tecmo's main team, Team Ninja. And he resurrected this series from being dead for about a decade. He sure did. And has now made it, uh, in his mind, because he's very egotistical, the premier fighting game, and or not fighting game, but premier action game. And he will fight tooth and nail... Uh, to demand that his games are best uh, like he calls out other game developers like the guy that developed uh, Devil May Cry and and that guy doesn't hold any animosity he's just like you know hey we both have great games oh but not Itagaki Itagaki demands that his games are best and that everyone else sucks and you know that that makes sense coming from the guy that designed this game it, Itagaki is an interesting character he really is into American culture and American rock and roll culture. So he always shows up in leather jackets and has sunglasses on. No matter where you see this guy, no matter what event, no matter how dimly lit the room is, he wears sunglasses. He's he got wears long his hair. At night. He's total punk rock. He's got uh, to the point that he has Steven Tyler or Mick Jagger lips. Literally, the guy's a rock star in video gaming. And uh, so he brings a lot of flash and flair to the table. When you watch, if if you ever watch him speak, he like grabs the mic like, like a singer would. Like he's speaking into it. He's dominating, and uh, really an interesting character and one of uh, uh, the interesting game designers that cropped up in the mid '80s during this time. Oh, why am so wasting he, my time on that? So he's become pretty much uh, you know the head designer at Tecmo. Which, uh, Team Ninja existed. Damn, Ninja. <laughs> you rocked that. So, uh, Itagaki, uh, worked on the original Tecmo Bowl, then became head of Team Ninja, and, uh, released this and, um, the other Tecmo Bowls. And so he's become prolific in the industry. And here's part of the reason why, as Ray said, one of the earliest games to have cutscenes of this magnitude, it wasn't just a little text bubble with your character's head this is showing actual kind of cinema some action almost to the you know like an anime or like a film uh, with some with some emotion and character so and they even have it broken up into acts acts uh, so a lot of things that we hadn't seen in video games that were finally capable to be done on the Nintendo Entertainment System and of course you know this is no cutscene like we would see on the PlayStation 10 years later but this set the roots for what we would see in cinematics uh, in interactive entertainment in the future now there is something I'd like to add to is um, Itagaki is um, also very good at making some of the hardest games ever created like the Ninja Gaiden series is you know not 
not as bad as ghosts and goblins, like, you know, we're going to throw everything possible at you. But Ninja Gaiden is, like, unrelentingly hard. <laughs> unrelentingly hard, and it has stupendous level design. The, uh, you know, the, all these Nintendo Entertainment System ones, 1, 2, and 3, were phenomenal. And the Xbox one, uh, and I, of course the second one's on the way now. I can't wait to see what that one looks like. But the first one I played through, and the level design was almost impeccable. I mean, it was so fluid. You had to, it's so challenging, but you learn the level. You learn how to play it, how to react, and you become one with the character. You become the ninja. And so that's why this series has become so prolific and why this character I don't know what you're talking about with one with the character at all <laughs> this character Ryu Hayabusa is one with Ray at this moment and uh, you just see how intensely difficult Fuck. this is but up to that point he was having a flawless run and it's just so challenging one little misstep and you're done and you react as if you are one with the game. <laughs> and uh, Tomonobu Itagaki was also charged with a sexual harassment lawsuit <laughs> more recently. Ooh. So there's a little bit more about him. <laughs> maybe not something he's so much proud of, but maybe he is. Again, he's a rock star. Of course he's going to sleaze himself up on women. What do they expect? <laughs> I'm not saying it's right, but... That's, that's what the, rock stars do. It's the type of guy he is. He's going to do it. So he's going to get a sexual harassment lawsuit now and again, you know. That happens. You work for a guy like that, he's probably going to whip his wang out at you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face facts. All right. And this next... we're we're getting deep into the uh into the commentary here cuz I'm just getting silly here because we've been going at this for I don't even know how long. This has been a very long uh analysis of the system, but we wanted to cover all the main genres, all the main games, and there was just too many to exclude. We we had a very tight list of of uh, 30 plus games. Oh, we had the, the list was even longer than this before we started cutting. Yeah, we had to make cuts, so, uh, and we'll follow up with more Ray's Retro reviews and more addendums to this console war. Uh, you know, some of the series we just didn't want to do because we wanted to spend more time talking about the game specifically, whereas the focus of this uh, has been to talk about the Nintendo system, its impact, and what it brought to the table, and what these games brought to the table. And not to mention its complete domination in its day. <laughs> you know, it, it You want to talk it domination. Rocked the house. <laughs> Nintendo was, at one time, the most profitable company in the world. Even over Exxon. Over Exxon, over IBM, over any stock brokerage, over any company in the world, nobody was generating more profit with their products and services than Nintendo Company Limited, which is just tantamount to, to all of that. As we said, Hiroshi Yamauchi is still the most wealthy man in Japan, and he's not even the president of the company anymore. He's stepped down. He's just a shareholder and, you know father figure and uh, let's throw out another Hiroshi Yamauchi factoid real quick this man uh, we've spoken very highly about as a a great businessman but he is not a game designer in fact he does not really care for video games and does not like video games as an entertainment medium he was documented a, of playing a video game one time in his entire life the guy that turned Nintendo into a game company and an executive produced every Nintendo game played one video game. What game? Othello. Okay. Based on, on the parlor game Othello for the Famicom. And he sat down and tried playing it and he couldn't get his hands around the controller. He didn't like how it felt in his hand. He didn't like how you press the buttons. And after several minutes of playing Othello, he threw the controller down in disgust, walked away, and never touched a video game again ever. Wow. <laughs> this is the guy that has some of the best sense of what makes a video game great, and that's what we don't really understand about this guy is he could tell you whether a video game was going to be good or bad by listening to the game design concept. 
would not engage in the activity, did not like the activity, didn't find it entertaining. But he knew... He just knows how people work. He has such a sense about about what's entertaining, about a, a medium level of, of entertaining and uh, keeping people into it. And, uh, and so he just has a great business sense, and that's what really made Nintendo stand out and got them to the top. An amazing character, an amazing man, and an evil man to a degree in the sense of, of humans being evil and not in the the um, religious sense of good and evil. I mean in, in tactics and, and character. I mean he was a fierce, brass-balled individual that you did not want to cross. He had a steely look in his eyes and uh, you would not want to get on his wrong side, but he was a great businessman and, and brought some of the greatest video games in the world to us. Not as a designer, but just as a as a father figure. So let's see one of these other games that this guy helped bring along. Yeah, this is this uh, is a a rather ingenious game that was just discovered. You know, it was discovered. One, but Nint Nintendo has a knack for looking for these really original game concepts, games like they would make, pit, scat, uh, snatching them up and distributing them. So let's see a great example of this. Okay, so we're going to take a look at a game from Alexei Pashinov, and I've butchered his Russian name because they have letters that we can't pronounce in English. Now, Alexei, we're going to call him, was a professor in Russia and he worked at a university. He was into computer science, and Russia didn't have a video game industry of any sort. Russia everything, didn't have an industry. <laughs> everything was government run during the, the old Soviet Union, and there was no such thing as creative endeavors such as video game design. So Alexei Patinov played around with his little computers in his, uh, in his uh, classrooms, and came up with this weird little concept where these little falling blocks would come down in several different shapes and you would have to arrange them and into lines filling the board and they would clear as they went and that you would was have thought that a simple game design like that would turn into this <laughs> yeah it was not envisioned as a as a commercial item it was not sat down in a boardroom meeting to say what can our next big game be this was just a dude a nerd a Russian who wanted to play with his his computers and came up with a cool idea and so as he started to to distribute it uh, to the universities in Russia and to different universities it became well known and no one was selling it and in America and in the industrialized world, in the capitalist societies, if you're not selling it and there's interest generated in it, then what are you doing? So Nintendo takes their lawyer, Mr. Howard Lincoln, a figure that would become very pivotal in Nintendo during many of their lawsuits and during what we're going to talk about with this game. So as Ray's intensely battling these falling blocks. Yeah, I kind of lost track. We're going to go ahead and let him stay focused on that, and I'm going to tell the tale of Tetris. So, Howard Lincoln goes to Russia to try and procure this game. At the same time, the nefarious Tengen, owned by Atari, Tengen. was also trying to procure this game. As was another company called Bulletproof Software, who was just a software developer. All of them saw the potential of this great game that no one was selling and that was technically owned by Russia, which meant that it was fair game because Russia wasn't selling it. They just needed rights to it. So everybody all at once went to go get it. Everybody in the end ended up with rights to it. It was a huge mess. They ended up giving all three companies legal rights to it so they had to battle out in American court who actually owned this damn game and who should be getting the money for it. So, 
when it comes out of Russia as a retail release, we see three different versions. We see the Nintendo version, which is this in the Game Boy version. We which see is by far the superior version, in my opinion. We see... We will get into that. We, <laughs> we see the Tengen version, and we see the Bulletproof Software version, which is essentially the Tengen version. So, uh, the three of them all come out and are on the market and all selling. Nintendo continues to fight in court, and Howard Lincoln eventually wins and gets Nintendo full rights to Tetris. Bulletproof Software and Tengen have to quit making them. Tengen loses to Nintendo again. Tengen sucks. Bulletproof Software walks away with their tail between their legs. And Nintendo has one of the best-selling games of all time. They release it with their Game Boy system because they needed a killer app for the release of the Game Boy and they didn't want another Mario game. They wanted something something different, something that you could put in your pocket and pull out and quickly play. Something that adults could get into too. Something everyone could get into and this was it and they knew they had to have it and they got it and and that helped you know, the, I'm sure the Game Boy would have made it anyway, but this definitely helped solidify its place in history. Oh, that, that just gave the di the Game Boy, like, stomping grounds over it, everything it else. It gave it market domination for ten years. Yeah, essentially. Tetris just handed it the market. So there's Tetris. Howard Lincoln, uh, again, did such a great job with these court cases that Nintendo continued to promote him within the company, to the point where uh, after uh, Mr. Arakawa left, he took over as president of Nintendo of America for a brief period, and then he moved on to become general manager of the Seattle Mariners baseball team, whom Nintendo also owns. Well, Hiroshi Yamauchi owns. I, I was wondering if they still own them or not. I was pretty sure of it. Yeah, Yamauchi still owns the Mariners, and Howard Lincoln is still in charge of, of them. So Nintendo fully still has their hands in that baseball team. You know, with all that Wii money, they should be able to field a pretty decent team. God, you'd think. <laughs> uh, but that's also why on the Super Nintendo, uh, you saw... Ken Griffey. Ken Griffey Jr.'s Major League Baseball. It didn't have all of the the N uh, MLBA players. It only had the Major League Baseball teams and Ken Griffey Jr. The rest were made-up players. He only needed Ken Griffey Jr. in those days. Yeah, he was he was really good, and he didn't do it with steroids, kids. Yeah, steroids was, are bad. Ken Griffey Jr. was a real champ, but unfortunately, he didn't get the get regarded as highly as some of the steroid freaks that have come along. But you know, he's a class a, class A athlete, and a, seems like a good guy. He's, I could be wrong. He could be a crazy prostitute screwing coke addict, but. No, he he's actually he never a got he guy. never got caught, we'll say so. <laughs> as best we know, he's a great guy. Yeah, I just have, I went too far with that one. No, Ken Griffey's uh Ken Griffey's a great guy. We love Ken Griffey. Yeah, and so does Nintendo. So otherwise, they wouldn't have paid him so much money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also here's an interesting side note. Uh. Nintendo owns the Seattle Mariners. Okay. I'm not sure if he still plays because I don't keep up with uh, baseball, but does Kurt Schilling still play for the Mariners? No, he plays for the Boston Red Sox. Did he play for the Mariners? I th think. Um, not sure on that one. Not sure on that because... I think he played for the Phillies. Because baseball is pretty lame. But <laughs> uh, I'm just going to take that stance. <laughs> But, Fair enough. But Kurt Schilling uh, is a video game playing quasi-celebrity uh, who plays EverQuest. So Sony Online hired him um, for an advertising campaign. So that's why I was just wondering if he played for the Mariners and if there'd be a conflict of interest there. Oh, no, no. <laughs> advertising for Sony and working for Nintendo. Uh, yeah, I don't think that would work. So just an interesting side note there. I think that might be in their contracts. Um, if you do anything for Sony Electronics, um, we will have to trade you immediately. <laughs> wow, these guys take their uh, electronics seriously, don't they? <laughs> yes, so, they do. Alright, so back to the beaten path. Uh, Nintendo scored Tetris, 
Tenjin was once again shamed in court by Nintendo. Motherfucker! Oh, 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 sorry, Ray. It froze. Well, and I was almost up to a hundred lines. We should mention at this point one problem with the Nintendo Entertainment System hardware in the United States was that sometimes it wasn't that reliable. The <laughs> the connectors that the cartridges uh, connected with weren't always the best. The connectors on the cartridges would sometimes get messed up. So sometimes games would freeze up and quit playing. Sometimes it would take 10 minutes to get a game working because you had to cajole it into the system. So uh, many I've... people know this screen and the frustration that goes with having a really good game going and then it crapping Freezes. up. So here's another opportunity to say shop at newgengamers.com shop.newgengamers.com if you go there you can purchase a Nintendo Entertainment System with a brand new 72 pin connector which helps eliminate a lot of the load up problems but can't always solve cartridge problems like this so let's try something else Entry. Nintendo introduces Tetris. Put a piece here, put a piece there. Use your thumbs, use your eyes. Find yourself Tetris time. Now you're playing with power. Recognize that music? Why, it's Final Fantasy. Yes, it is, folks. Brought to us by Squaresoft. Now... In the mid-80s, there was a slew of role-playing games in the United States on the computer market. But up to that point, the home consoles didn't have the power to play these games. The Atari, the closest thing they had was Quest, which by RPG standards was not an RPG. It was more of what we'd call today an adventure game or an action RPG game. So those games were not available previously to the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now we've got this brand new type of game that's available on the Nintendo. So the first to strike successfully oh, is... Oh, we get the actual opening screen. Yes, isn't that awesome? Yeah, this is after you clear the, the first part. So... A company called Chunsoft in Japan creates a game called Dragon Quest mm. and releases it uh, with the help of the publisher Enix and Video Game History is Born. The first console RPG out of Japan is born. At the same time, a struggling young upstart of a video game company called Squaresoft was looking for that killer game. They tried several titles, and one of their founders, uh, uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi. You should see his name here somewhere. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was watching for him here. Uh, and also Amano, who we just saw, is pivotal for this game. But Sakaguchi made the game Rad Racer, and it didn't take off so well. And uh, so the company was down on their luck. They had one more chance. There was one more game that they could make they, that before they would be bankrupt. If they were going to make it, this game had had to succeed for them. So, Hironobu Sakaguchi sat down and decided that this was going to be the final fantasy for Squaresoft. And that's where the name came from was that this was going to be the final attempt for this company 
If it failed, they were done. And it was a fantasy game. Yeah. So there's where the name came from. So they volleyed and released the second big RPG in Japan. And so a huge war was born between Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy as to which was the better and dominant RPG. And they both released a slew of titles over the years. Uh, and it got so big that at one point um, in Japan, school children were given the day off of school when Dragon Quest games were going to be released because the teachers knew the kids were not going to show up for school. So they just called the day off and let the kids play Dragon Quest. Now, I wish they'd do that here. Yeah, that that is huge. That's never happened in America. We've never gotten a day off of school for a video game. And that's how integral video games became in the Japanese culture, especially these role-playing games. So, uh, we picked Final Fantasy to play here because Final Fantasy has become the more enduring one and uh, is still the more popular one. Although, in the battle between... Um, Enix and Square, Enix eventually won out because Enix was simply a publisher publishing different RPGs where Square was developing all their titles in-house and eventually bled themselves dry with uh, bad business moves, which uh, if you want to hear more about that, listen to our podcast on um, Square Enix. But Square Enix, uh, Enix eventually bought Square to form all under one roof. Uh. And and they also bought Taito, so all of those games are now released uh, under Enix. I've forgotten the original version. You have to click on each one individually. Yes. They will not continue cycling through the enemies. Yeah, they did. They revised that in the later re-releases, which has been re-released multiple times at this point. Yes, this has been on many, many consoles. PlayStation 1, Game Boy Advance, PSP. I'm hurting. So this was Sakaguchi's big breakout title, and so Square decided what type of games they were going to make from that point on. And it was pretty much all RPGs from then on. And they released so many uh, that we've never seen in America. They became prolific and uh, became one of those key companies that, that helped... Uh, make or break a video game console whether you had their support or not <clears throat> so we also saw uh, Amano-san's name as the uh, artistic designer of this game he was key in many of the of the Final Fantasy games in drawing the characters which if you look at the characters here they're pretty basic but he came up with the original designs, which looked a lot better, you know, uh, and looked like actual fantasy characters, and the monsters looked a lot better. But at the time, this had great graphics. So Amano would stay on with the company uh, for a while and do a lot of things. Sakaguchi and many of his underlings would eventually leave Square Enix, but again, that's another story. As far as, far as the NES goes, they ended up releasing Final Fantasy 2 and 3 uh, in Japan, but they never made it to America until... Uh, Years later. Yeah, until recently. So this is the one people knew of, and uh, this didn't come out right away in America. Uh, again, they didn't think RPGs were going to take off in America. So Nintendo helped publish this game in America and actually did the publishing rights for it and released a strategy guide in Nintendo Power along with it because they knew that this depth of game hadn't been experienced by an American audience too much and uh, to help them get more into it because you know we're dumb and have short attention spans which I'm not gonna argue with that that mindset that Japanese people have about us is pretty accurate but I think they could have handled Final Fantasy I think I don't think that was out of their reach well, obviously Final Fantasy 2 was uh, ridiculous yeah it was very difficult there was a lot of of management but obviously these games worked RPGs are now one of the most popular genres among hardcore gamers and so um, everyone who took a chance on RPGs made out at this time especially uh, mr. Hironobu Sakaguchi 
made out probably better than anyone individually off of RPGs from Japan. Now another thing uh, with RPGs and strategy games from Japan not making it to America, this was a belief that Nintendo held, and uh, a second party of theirs uh, called Intelligent Systems released many games like this. Now we don't have any Intelligent System games to play for the NES because... They didn't release them in America. <laughs> they didn't release them in America. Intelligent Systems was an offshoot of HAL. Uh, several of, of their members went off to form this company. Nintendo picked them up as a second party. And they released the Wars series, which started off as the Famicom Wars. Then there was the Game Boy Wars, Super Nintendo Wars. And then they eventually came to America as the Advance Wars. They also had the Fire Emblem series, which was prolific in Japan, along, right along with... Uh, Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, but they never made it to America till much later as well. So America really missed out on some great RPGs and some great games because of a belief that Americans would not enjoy those types of games. So if you want to play those types, uh, you may have to import them. Import or emulate because you cannot get a legitimate uh, translated American version. So. It's kind of a shame that that uh, we missed out on all those great games, but eventually Nintendo saw what Intelligent Systems was doing, and the thing that really brought them to America, as we discussed um, in other discussions, was Paper Mario. Yeah, Paper Mario was a big thing. So check out the N64 console wars for a little bit more on Intelligent Systems. So, this is your role-playing game, turn-based battle system. You have characters with different classes, with different uh, specialties in battle. Some specialize in physical attacks, some specialize in magic attacks, some specialize in defense. And of course, these games are based off the original Dungeons & Dragons games released in America, um, which were the pen and paper RPGs, and then... Uh, as computer technology advanced, people began making them into computer games, and uh, so Japan really created their own niche um, version of how RPGs were to be made, and it basically follows the model that Dragon Quest and Dra or Final Fantasy set, and pretty much every RPG, even to today, is heavily, heavily influenced by those two games. Yeah, Final Fantasy was a groundbreaking title and continues to be so to this day. I mean, every new Final Fantasy comes out with, you know, some different system or they want to try something different. So much to the point that uh, some of the hardcore Final Fantasy fans say that Final Fantasy XII, the newest one, is the best one yet. So, you know, they've continued to improve and every one of them's great. Just a prolific series. Save for maybe 11, unless you're an online player. That's the thing. It, 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 it stuck out to a really niche audience. It was a good game. It just wasn't like the other Final Fantasies. So. But that's that game's still going. I mean, it's going strong with a continued uh, growing user base, which is even more impressive because it's going across several consoles uh, several PC generations now and and it's still going strong so that's tad amount to to what they did with that yeah I think they did a fantastic job with it and one of my characters died oh Vivi Vivi is done yeah I didn't get a chance I didn't power level these characters these are this is somebody else's game and we have a lot of memorable characters from the Final Fantasy series, such as the Black Mage. They're so generic, but they're, they're such an iconic-looking character. And uh, I used to actually have a, uh, a Black Mage sprite from this game cut out on my wall. I actually I have the little Vivi doll. Sweet. <laughs> so when Final Fantasy IX came out, they actually uh, brought back the, the classic Black Mage from these games as that as that character and uh, gave one a personality 
So Vivi became a memorable character. So anytime you see a black mage anymore, most of the time people name it Vivi. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost become its own... Uh, I don't know what. It's kind of become... A, a lasting uh, character that's that was a, a, tr originally just a generic character. You yeah. know, the black mage has now become something through the character Vivi, and that's what Square uh, brought to the table and what these RPGs game, games brought to the table uh, as opposed to traditional space games and military games was uh, they all have a heartfelt story. They're both mostly set in you know a world filled with chaos where one group or one individual needs to rise up and and save everything and you know you really get an attachment to the character and with this one you know you name the characters and and make you up draw the, your own attachments yeah you draw your own attachments later games would have very set characters um, and would become more like interactive movies really So this we was have, we've really delved into the lore of Final Fantasy. I think we've covered that. I think we're good. So let's let's, let's look at one more game. One probably, one more game that over 17 million people have purchased. Behind the flabby facade, a physical powerhouse, a street fighter, a weapons expert. He's whatever the situation demands. In Kirby's adventure, evil King Didi stolen Dreamland's dreams. Now Kirby's fighting to get him back, level by nightmarish level. That's Kirby. He's cute. Will you cross him? Then he's one tough cream puff. Kirby's adventure, new on NES. Hey there, tube heads, wake up! You know that $49.95 check that Granny sent you? You know that'll get you your very own Nintendo Entertainment System. Get one and you can play the new Mega Man 6 and battle evil robots. Stop watching those wig commercials. I can even shower with it. And there's Soda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2, where you battle Soda, the man with no face. No more mommy soaps for you. As teardrops fall. So, thank Granny! Cash the check and get the NES. You have watched too much TV already. あの勇者たちが今ニューファミコンに出会う。ニューファミコンで蘇る伝説の物語。攻略本付きファイナルファンタジー。ワン、ツー。一つになって暗号が発売。ファミリーコンピューター登場。カセットを挿入すると、カラ
probably one of the most iconic games of all time. Well, I don't think we could talk about the Nintendo Entertainment System without talking about Super Mario Bros. 3, <clears throat> especially considering it was the number one standalone selling game for the system. Super Mario Bros. 1 sold more because it was packed in with the Nintendo, but Mario 3 sold 17 million, and very few of those were packed in with consoles. Most of them were just retail purchases. Yeah. So, at the time, it was the best-selling game of all time. It sat at the top of the sales charts for, I think, a couple years, actually. Uh, has anything <laughs> surpassed it? Um, yeah, the Pokemon series has now, and some other Nintendo stuff has. Uh, I believe the Grand Theft Auto series has or come close. The big series. Now, the, your Grand series, Trismos. but any single game. Sing yeah, single games have, but not many. It's still very, very high up on the all-time list. Because I was always wondering, do you count Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue separately? Um, I don't think they do. I'm not sure. Actually, I think they do. Either way, it's it's outsold it. Okay. Each iteration of Pokemon, I think, is outsold it, actually. But Pokemon's at the time... <laughs> but, but at the time, this, and for a lot of years, this was the best-selling game by far. Look at Ray and his tricks. Oh, I know this game like the back of my freaking hand. <laughs> so, we've said so much about Miyamoto and Nintendo's first-party efforts throughout this dialogue. Uh, so, if you're just jumping into the, to the last episode, then you're going to have to watch the rest to get the whole story. Because this has been a long, long journey here. And let it also be said that we've done this all in one sitting. Uh, sat down from beginning to end and played through every one of these titles. So this has been a long journey for us. We've been running our mouths for a long time here. But there's so much to say. And and with the NES, it's it's really hard not to say so many things because so, many, so much stuff was happening back then. Yeah, it's so pivotal in the video game industry and in the, the grand scheme of the industry as far as what it did. We didn't even go into the the wacky other peripherals that were released for this system, such as the Power Glove, the U-Force, the uh, Power Pad, um, to go along with the Zapper. Oh yeah, like uh, the extras and the... the... The fact that this system was able to go online in Japan, um, if you look on the bottom of your Nintendo, there's a little expansion slot which was never used in America. But in Japan, you could get the Famicom Disk System, and you could also go online with a service that they had and do things that you wouldn't be able to do for years on the World Wide Web, such as check the news, check the weather, check the horse race results, because it was Japan, of course, and uh, things that, that we would later um, associate with what we, can, what we can do on the World Wide Web and on the Internet now was uh, done on this early internet service that Nintendo set up for the Famicom. So it had a lot of legs and a lot of things were done with it. Uh, and with so many developers working on so many things for it, there were so many ideas generated, so many game genres that were born. Uh, you know, as we said, the RPG, the puzzle game, uh, you know, the action RPG adventure type games. The, the platformer. Pl the platform games. The simulated sports games all of these things were not available previously they didn't have the memory they didn't have the system to do it developers went wild worldwide with this machine and gamers went wild playing it everyone loved this thing and uh, I don't know anyone that's going to dispute that it was the best system of the time you'd have to be the most loyal Sega, Sega or Atari fan that ever existed and Oh, come on. And if, if you'd rather play one of those systems, then go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that... I did that intentionally. <laughs> Ray wants his, his powers. Because Ray is going to cheat. It's not but cheating. It's not cheating if it's designed to be there. It's not like I'm game genieing the damn thing. Again, it's <laughs> it's Miyamoto's look at the world. You're uh, you know the way I look at what he did with these types of things is 
almost like time warps or multi-dimensional uh, views uh, really theoretical type stuff where you're looking at things that just aren't there because where are you going Ray there's nowhere to go what are you doing what uh, what you mean you can go over to the right for some reason whoa that whistle what's that whistle do Ray that is a warp whistle warp whistle what would you need a warp whistle for to warp to other worlds of course <laughs> so uh, Shigeru Miyamoto came up with these wacky ideas in his head and they're otherworldly they truly are it's it's multi-dimensional time warping and things that that only futurists can can fathom and uh, so really an interesting person and this was of course his his baby and his no, no, his seminal piece on the the Nintendo Entertainment System. Yeah, this was his his masterpiece for the NES. I that mean, or a Zelda, lot of people I mean, will say Legend of Zelda. And, it's a toss up. Yeah, those two were both such great games that you can't really dispute either one of them not being great. It's just you know, I'm not going to get into a match over oh, what one's better. Ray gets a card. And five ups. And I'm freaking insane in this game. I like finishing the game with 99 lives, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> and another thing uh, with the pop culture aspect of what this system did, it's brought words into our vernacular like one up. The term one up, you know, we use it as a common term and common phrase, but that, that phrase comes solely from the Nintendo Mario series. That, that word exists nowhere else. It does now. Yeah, it does We now. use it, but, uh, you know, that word came exclusively from this system. And uh, I mentioned this with the PlayStation, and I'll also mention it with this one, because uh, Nintendo dominated the industry, and the sign that you are the number one console on the market is whenever people want to play video games or engage in interactive entertainment, they mention your product by name. So... Yeah. You played Nintendo. You went and hung out with your buddies and played Nintendo. You sat in your room and played Nintendo. You weren't playing Atari anymore. No, you were playing Nintendo. <laughs> everyone forgot Atari. And now everyone was playing with power. And there was no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. And the thing is that Super... Super Mario Brothers 3 was such a huge phenomenon, too, with 17 million copies, and those were all sold within, what, two, three years. The game was so big that it had a movie tie-in that the, the, its main, release. the main selling point of the movie was that it had a trailer for this game in it, because if you, if you watched the movie in the theater, you got the first look at this game because they'd never de debuted it in public. So this was the first chance the American public got to see the design and see what was coming. So the movie The Wizard was essentially a two-hour promo for this game. And so here's one other thing we didn't get into, and while we're on our final video here, let's go ahead and talk about it. The marketing that Nintendo brought to the table. Atari had some good marketing, but Nintendo took it to a new level uh, with... Uh, the catchphrase now you're playing with power that became a very well known and synonymous with Mother. the system uh, as well as uh, you know we talked about the Kirby ad that we saw come along and of course the best advertisement that Nintendo came up with that no other game company up to that point had thought well it maybe thought of but didn't really pounce on the way Nintendo of America did the fanzine that's true. I became a Nintendo faithful because of Nintendo Power, and I'm doing what I'm doing now because of Nintendo Power. Because it was the first well uh, put together, professionally done um, fan magazine for video games, uh, exclusively run by the company. It wasn't, you know, done by an independent source, so it was very. Uh, controlled as far as what was um, you know talked about and of course they promoted Nintendo's games but Nintendo's games were so good that you know it's not like they were 
lying about the games being good. You know, they were they could back up what they were saying, but but that magazine uh, became a great way to sell Nintendo games. Whenever you subscribe to the to it, you got a player's guide for a new game. So that kept you playing that game. That's a twenty dollar value. You got all the tips and tricks. You got codes you couldn't get anywhere else. You got the latest previews. So many great things that the magazine brought to the table that that helped create the video game culture. And, you know, the culture that we have in America for video games maybe wouldn't be here today without that magazine because, you know, in, in Japan, the video game culture was embraced much more by popular culture. But in America, it's always been looked at as as kind of a in-the-closet hobby, not something that the mainstream uh, media really has embraced. And Nintendo Power and the and all the early game magazines such as Game Pro and uh, and things of that sort um, helped create the culture that, that that we're all part of now and gave us a place to feel at home, to write our fan letters in and say how much we liked uh, the Zelda series and uh, you know to talk about the high score that we got and send it into the magazine to show other players and all the things that we do on the internet now and we do with our online services were only able to be done with the print publications at that time and Nintendo really fostered that so I give them a lot of props for embracing that sure it helped them sell things but the other companies weren't proactive on that and didn't help build that sense of community that Nintendo did. Yeah, it it really was kind of just bringing it all out now. They're just handing it to you and going, well, hey, try this out. You'll you, like it. You love this, make it, uh, you know, part of your life. I remember, you know, being excited every month and waiting. I knew the day around the time when the Nintendo Power Magazine was going to arrive in my mailbox, and I would check every day, waiting for that to appear and so uh, you know personally I I read pretty much every issue of that magazine from um, probably about issue 20 to well over issue 100 when I subscribed to it oh look at the trickery of Ray oh I, I told you I know every secret in this game <laughs> so uh, there, there are secrets and tricks abounding in this game, and, and just all you have to do is find the way around them. And the trickery that Nintendo also had was to find out a lot of these little tricks and how to get through these games, you had to get Nintendo Power because you could write in letters asking how to get past these certain bosses, and they would answer with the Counselor's Corner and the, tips in, uh, the, uh, the classified information section of the magazine. So... A prolific magazine in the history of, of video game publications, and that, uh, you know, again, we wouldn't be here without them, and, um, you know, perhaps none of the, you know, big video game publications would be here if not for them. There was other things such as Computer Gaming World and some other smaller startups at the time, but Nintendo Power was the first that was promoted. It really so, took it to the next level. Yeah, because it had the corporate funding to be just everything that it that it could be they had so many cool things you know the the merchandise you could get only in the magazine that I would love to see the the collections that people have of that stuff oh yeah because there were so many items you couldn't get anywhere else like gold n64 controllers and things like that you know what I thought was the coolest bonus they ever did the Legend of Zelda collector's edition disc oh my yes that was very very highly sought after and still is very highly sought after as a collector's item these days. And of course, Ray has a copy. Yeah. <laughs> Got it straight from Nintendo Power for free. And that one is not for sale on shop.newgengamers.com <laughs> because that is a personal Ray copy that uh, you would have to actually physically murder him to take. And I believe his spirit would probably chase after you and haunt you if you did that. So I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, um, pretty tight with my Zelda. <laughs> and as we go here, we try not to give too much of a biased viewpoint of these, of these companies and of these systems, and try not to be fanboys. But uh, Ray and I are definitely Nintendo fanboys through and through. Uh, we've been weaned on these uh, games since we were young lads, and you we've got played, me. 
we've played for over 20 years uh, each. So uh, it's hard not to be. Well, you know what? There's a difference between a fanboy and a loyalist. Fanboys blindly spout crap, and loyalists just tell it, you know, the reason they're playing those games is because of this. <laughs> well, I think video game expert Luke Feather put it best when he said that uh, you may be a fanboy, Ray, but you're a fanboy with purpose. Because, you know, the, the company backs up uh, their quality time and time again, so it's easy to, easy to be a Nintendo fanboy if you've played their stuff. And especially if you played the old stuff, uh, and you know, there once played a, a lot of the old stuff, <laughs> and so has Ron, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing the company find that rebirth again, and a lot of uh, these young whippersnapper players, who only grew up on PlayStation, <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of players now aren't familiar with these old games. So if you're not, watch through these videos, pick up these old games. They are so great that if you missed them, you're really missing out. And they're not the parlor games that a lot of the Atari fair was where you pop the game in and 15 minutes later you go, okay, I'm going to go play with my dick now. You know, <laughs> these games hold your interest and can keep you there uh, for dozens and dozens of hours and really fulfill your life with, with entertainment. You know, you got to do something. We can't all, uh, you know, cure cancer or save the world. So when you're in, in the, the common world, you got to have something to do, and I think this is a great activity to engage in, and, uh... More trickery on my part. <laughs> oh, yes. And and this is one of the best ways that people spent their time during the, the 80s and early 90s. So, um, what else, Ray? There was a second model of the Nintendo Entertainment System released. Yeah, it was a shrunk-down model. Due to the design flaws of the original Nintendo... It was a top-loading system, much like the Atari, Super Nintendo, Genesis, and most other cartridge-based systems, because you didn't have as many problems with the the connectors uh, getting messed up and getting dirt in them. So, oh, uh, something I didn't get to finish was the reason they designed it. it that way. Oh yes, was because um, they wanted to make it seem like it was more of like a toy instead of a video game machine which were so unpopular at the time yeah they wanted it to to uh, to not look like a computer they wanted it to either be a toy or a cool high-end electronic like your cool VCR that you had you know uh, which you know is still novel at the time so what they did was they packed in the zapper and then they packed in like Rob the robot. And... Oh, we didn't even mention Rob. Again, we I think we need to do a an addendum to this later on just on the peripherals that were available for this system cuz there were so many not they didn't really work out too well, but they're all really interesting and would open up doors for future input devices that we would see, you know, a lot of the the technologies that were tested with the Nintendo Entertainment System that didn't work out, such as the Zapper, such as the Power Glove, are now being used successfully in the Wii. So they really brought it all full circle. Again, we talked about the Game Boy's original designs being brought into the DS. You know, they've they've innovated so much, and again, uh, this console innovated so many things such as the directional pad, another Gunpei Yokoi innovation. The directional pad was invented for the Game & Watch systems as a new input device as opposed to the joysticks of the arcade and home systems. You couldn't put a joystick on that handheld system, so he needed a new way to do it. Came up with the D-pad, and they kept it for this system, and it, it changed how games were played. Yes, it did, and you no know, no one wanted a joystick after you used the directional pad. No, it it was pretty much you know done for. Yeah, yeah, the joystick was dead at that point. So another thing that Nintendo killed, you know, Atari did so many things, but then they petered off so quickly in the industry, and Nintendo swept up all of that and innovated and and just kept going with it. As you can see, I'm one section away from. Bowser's Castle here. Well, let's not push it, Ray. Just <laughs> keep playing. You keep playing here, and I'm going to keep running my mouth. Uh, 
so Nintendo released that boxed up second model of the NES that looked uh, more like a traditional video game system I guess and uh, released it at a budget price but they were they're rare these days because they weren't out for very many years and by that point most people had the system and now they're so coveted because they are the most reliable version of the NES console. Yeah, unless you get one of those cheap Asian knockoff ones. Which I don't recommend. Yeah, we, New Gen Gamers doesn't recommend uh, cheap Asian knockoffs because... They are cheap Asian knockoffs. Yeah, they tend to break easy. Yeah, they're not as reliable. Not that the old NESs are, but, you know, it's, it's just not as genuine. And uh, I just... I, I think aesthetically, it's just a lot more fun playing with the original system. But with those dual FCs, um, you can play Nintendo and Super Nintendo games in one machine, so they do have that going for them. Yeah. But, uh, of course, Nintendo does not support any of these machines and does not like them being sold, but uh, not much they can do about it these days. Yeah, piracy is rampant. Oh! And I saved two for the castle. So we really didn't even talk about this game, but um, um, you've seen it. You've seen almost all the way through. You haven't seen most of the levels or the the great kookiness that goes along with it, such as the tanuki suit and the frog suit. When I say that I've, um, you know, just scratched the surface on this game, believe me. Yeah. Because it's there's so much more you can do. Every level's worth playing through and fun and... Uh, so, uh, oh, look at you. <laughs> More trickiness. Hey, I don't think I knew about that one. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, we wrap it up here with this, you know, one, and, of, one of the best NES games, um, and they really upgraded the design. New suits, new powers. And it just felt fresh. It felt fresh, even though the game design is essentially... The same. It's the same as Super Mario Brothers. And what's ironic about that is that at that time, everyone was trying to do platform games like Super Mario Brothers. And only Shigeru Miyamoto and Nintendo could outdo themselves with that design. And they would be the one, only ones who could do it again whenever they released Super Mario World. Except perhaps Sonic the Hedgehog, you know. And here's Raise a it, Bowser. Here's <laughs> a familiar face to any Nintendo fan. The evil like left or right. nefarious Bowser. I'm gonna say left. Yeah. I'll go with instinct. <laughs> so, um This is the bastard that's that's caused all these problems. Get him, Ray. He stole your woman. I think we're going to go with this hole. It's going to go low. Oh! Take that, Bowser. It's okay. You I got thought him. you knew where he was going to be, didn't you? But he's too fast. Too fast, Bowser. Got him. Oh! <laughs> so long, One Bowser. One run through. Your attempts to stop all that is good in the world is over. Your Outside reign of the terror. Suicide, did I lose? I don't believe so. Okay. <laughs> I feel good about myself now. <laughs> so, well, New Gen Gamers has now documented the beating of Super Mario Brothers 1, 2, and 3. Yes, we have. <laughs> So, check, check those out. Check them all out. Uh, the others are available as Ray's Retro Reviews. If you just look up Ray's Retro Review, you'll find us. If you look up New Gen Gamers, you'll find us. If you go to NewGenGamers.com, you'll find us. If you look it, up Console Wars of the Past, you will find us. Yes, and anywhere else On the you, front page. <laughs> you may find us in any language all around the world. So... This has been a look at the Nintendo Entertainment System and a ridiculous amount of games. And we tried to pack in 
as much lore as we could. I think we got a ton. <laughs> I think it, we got as much as we could. And so, to it, close it out, everybody, I guess we, all we have to say is remember your history or you're doomed to repeat it. But it, Nintendo seemed to have remembered their history because their newest system feels like the NES. Yes, and ironically, not in the intonation you mean, but they are repeating their past. Yeah. They are doomed to repeat it, but perhaps that's a good thing in this case. The successful part of their past. They've learned from the bad parts of their past and are looking back on these glory days, and that's what they're cashing in on. Uh, you know, this is bigger than it's ever been, and the system's 20 years old, so check it out. Check out the rest of our stuff, and play these games, because if you haven't, then you're missing out. All right, folks. Later. All right. That was epic. Yeah.